Run for the Show podcast. Welcome to episode 16 of Drum for the Song podcast. I am your host, Ding Campbell. Today's guest is Adam Parsons. So a little bit different this time. He's not technically a drummer in a band. However, he does play drums for Ricky Warwick on occasions. Um, but yeah, he's an artist manager. So he manages bands. Uh, so his management company is called Siren Artist Management. And they manage loads of amazing, cool bands like Europe, Saxon, Stiff Little Fingers, Uriah Heap, Tax the Heat, Black Star Riders, Ricky Warwick, Thin Lizzy, and Diamond Head. So some really cool um, bands there. So he's really interesting because of that. He also collects drums. Uh, he's got an incredible amount of drums. So I would recommend watching the YouTube version of this if you're listening to the audio version, or even if you're you know, finishing it off on the audio version, go back and check out the YouTube video just to see some of the drums that he owns. It's absolutely incredible. His drum room looks like a drum shop. It's amazing. So check that out. Um, he also used to work for Motorhead for about nine years as a tour manager. So we also talk about some of the funny Motorhead stories. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail now. You'll have to wait and see and check those out for yourselves. But there's some really funny ones in there. Um, but yeah, that's really cool. If it's your first time finding this podcast, please check out my other episodes. You can support the podcast on Patreon. So it's patreon.com forward slash drum for the song. There's three different tiers on there. The first one will give you access to bonus episodes. The second one gets you access to a video call with me every month. All the tiers will give you discount on Motorhead Beer. You get 20% off Motorhead Beer and access to a monthly competition. So you can win loads of Motorhead Beer giveaway freebie stuff. Really cool. We had our first winner last month. So congratulations to Rory for winning that prize. And yeah, please check it out. That'd be really great. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to thank my top tier Groove Master Patreon. So I, I actually have to read this out now because the list is getting really long, which is amazing. So thanks so much for the support. It really helps and makes me keep wanting to do this podcast, basically. Um, yeah, so I'd like to give a special thanks, top tier Groove Masters, Dean S. Monaghan, Rudy Pauly, Dan Hurst, Gareth Richards, Steve Hancock, Paul W. Grasmere. Charlie Farley, Kenny Kendrick, Yari Weissenen, and Paul Hutchins. Sorry if I mispronounce your name. Um, if I did mispronounce your name, feel free to send me a voice message to let me know how I should pronounce it, and I'll try and get it correct next time. Or join the video call, and then you can tell me yourself. But yeah, I think that's about it. Oh yeah, you can follow me on social media. Twitter and Instagram and TikTok is at drum for the song. Instagram and Twitter. You can also follow my personal page, Dane underscore drums. Facebook, there's a Drum for the Song official Facebook group, or you can follow me at Dane Campbell Drummer. I think that's about it. Um, enjoy this episode with Adam. If you're a drum nerd, you're going to love it. If you're not a drum nerd, I think you'll still find it interesting. So check it out. Um, Adam's a great guy and we had a really great conversation. So please enjoy. Thank you. Drum for the Song podcast. Hello, everybody. This is Drum for the Song. I'm Dane Campbell, and today I am with Adam Parsons of Siren Artist Management. Uh, he's also the owner of a few drum kits, as you can see, if you're watching on YouTube. So um, he's a big vintage drum collector and I think newish drum collector as well, I believe. Um, but yeah, he's got a lot of things to talk about today, including the lineup of artists that he manages. And we'll also talk about his collection in great detail. And he also used to work for Motorhead for 10 years. So some of you I know are Motorhead fans from previous episodes. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. I'm sure he's got some funny stories to talk about during that time. But how's it going today, Adam? Very well, Dane. Thank you so much for having me on. This is a real pleasure. And um, I'm a big fan of the podcasts and uh, the videos that you do. So, yeah, thank you. I appreciate this. Uh, uh, no worries. I appreciate you taking the time to do it. And <laughs> thanks for the kind words. And I'm glad someone's watching. So that's great. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, as you, as you know, then what we normally do, we, we, I kind of talk about the origins of drumming in relation to the guests. So 
what started your interest in drums in the first place and when did you start playing etc well yeah well i um i got into music kind of late i mean apart from when i was a kid top of the pops was where you got all your sort of you you heard the chart hits and you heard what the artists were of the day and that was kind of i was born in 65 and sort of 72 73 74 were my first sort of memories of of music but my parents weren't really musical they didn't have a record player till i was i think 11 or 12 and um the music they bought was not what i was into um so it was really at school at 14 years old i um I kind of, uh, through my peers at school, because I didn't have any older brothers or sisters, so I kind of got all my friends started getting into Led Zeppelin and Rush and, and all that, you know. And I, um, and I kind of uh, fell into it literally within a week. I was, that was it. I was going to be in the music business. And a year or so later, I was 15, and my friends at school were like, let's form a band, as you do, you know. And uh, I uh, had a guitar, a really cheap crappy satellite sort of three quarter size guitar um that uh had i think uh, one string missing and uh guitar was just something that it seemed like too much like hard work to me you had to learn chords you had to learn uh music you know and i thought oh i'll just be the drummer because uh i could literally knock out a beat but i thought anybody could i thought just boom boom da boom boom da was anybody could do that learning down the line years later that not everybody can do that you know so i went and bought a pair of drumsticks first rehearsal was on cardboard boxes and that was uh, i was 15 so that was sort of 1980 ish and then um i yeah i just fell into it big time and just wanted to be i wanted to be a drummer and um you know i love the drums always have i think the drums are an incredible instrument i'm a big fan of the of the makeup of the of the whole uh, instrument, you know, and um, yeah, so that's kind of how it how I fell into it. Amazing, that's it's, it's quite common <laughs> that people start on a guitar and then they move to drums. I've had a few guests that have a similar story to that. Um, I, I had I had three guitar lessons when I when I was eleven years old, and I learned three chords, and hmm. I still know those three chords. I actually know two more chords, but I don't know. I don't know the names of those chords, but I know the <laughs> finger. <laughs> so I can play five chords on the guitar, but literally I can't play guitar at all. But it was just, you know, I thought drumming was an easy way out. And uh, of course, you know, how wrong, <laughs> how wrong I was because, you know, to be a great drummer, it's, it's a real art, you know. Yeah, we're all, we're, we're all trying together. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very difficult. But yeah, that's, that's really interesting you say that. And um, But like when you say it's easy, I think some people take to it naturally and some people don't like i know some amazing guitarists that haven't got a clue how to play a drum beat or they exactly they well that's can't. what i'm saying yeah so i you know i kind of uh, i've managing all my acts the amount of incredible musicians that can't coordinate two limbs never mind four you yeah. know when it when when it comes to a, holding a pair of sticks so uh, it's something that yeah i you know you live and learn i just i i could i had fairly decent timing i mean i wasn't you know i could just knock out a beat and it was the same it was a boom boom da boom boom da boom boom da so the first sort of year and a half of playing drums that was what i played every song was boom boom da boom boom da and it was kind of either slower or faster <laughs> yeah i suppose yeah i guess you've got yeah. to start somewhere and that's very common that's, yeah yeah and very versatile so I guess when I guess once you've decided that right, I'm going to be a drummer now. Were there any particular drummers at the time that really influenced you, or you wanted to be like, or you idolised? Yeah, I mean, really, it's people like Cozy Powell, Ian Pace. When I first heard Fireball by Deep Purple, that just you know that was the first Purple album I got on cassette, and um, I just the you know the opening drum to Fireball just blew me away. Cozy Powell was a I was a huge fan of Cozy. You know, and then kind of in the in the sort of eighty three, I really got into people like um, uh, uh, Tommy Lee when he first came up with Motley Crue. But cool. my problem, but my problem was Dane. It was, you know, if I couldn't do a drum fill in the first four bars of the song, or I couldn't start the song with a drum intro, or I couldn't twirl my sticks. 
um, you know, it, this, it wasn't worth doing. And that was kind of a huge miss, well, a huge mistake on my part. I, cause I, I was always, I was self-taught, had a couple of lessons to learn to read dots and learn the basic note values. But there was some guy, he was in his, I don't know how old he was. I was, I was young. So he was, I was 18. He was probably 30, but he looked like he was 70 living <laughs> in, in, and he was in his front room with a bass drum and a pad and um, you know, a, and a music stand with notes on it. I was like, what's all this? I need to, you know, dude, what's all, you know, let me just, uh, you know, let's get this going. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and uh, so he, he, he was kind of, uh, I mean, he was just showing me the basic, the basic art of drumming, you know, but I did that for about four lessons and I couldn't be, couldn't be bothered. But I was out gigging straight away. I was kind of, after, four or five months of playing drums, I was out doing gigs with my one beat and thinking I could play the drums. Why would I need drum lessons, you know? And so anyway, um, you know, we, uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of how, that's where, I, that's how I, sorry, I, I totally lost track of, no, no. <laughs> of, the, of the question there. Well, oh, oh, sorry, drum was influenced, in, in, yeah. influenced me. That's all right. So, so, so it was all, it was all the, sort of, you know, the Tommy Lees of this world. And then I discovered Randy Castillo, who was, uh, you know, this is when he was in Lita Ford's band. I was at the Marquee in 84 when Lita Ford played and Randy was playing. And I thought that was just the coolest thing. Nice. But, you know, but then I really got into people like later on um, in the sort of mid to late eighties, I was into people like Joe Morello and a lot of these jazz drummers. I really started, you know, and, uh, Steve Smith from Journey uh, when you know and 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 I kind of but by then I was kind of I was stuck in my ways I was playing in this band that was still about the sort of the hair and the twirling the sticks and you know and I kind of stopped playing I stopped playing in 89 89 beginning of 89 was the last thing I ever did on the drums and I took 16 years off wow and in two, and in 2005 I came back um, eBay was there I started I I if you don't mind me telling you the story, I'll tell you how I, how I kind of got back into it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was managing a guy called Chris Slade, who was the drummer in ACDC. You know, Chris? Yeah. He used to babysit well, my dad, apparently. <laughs> that's right. That yeah. is right. He, he did actually tell me that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Also, and also your dad did as well. Um, and uh, so he, um, uh, Chris was with Pearl Drums and, and he was in the band Asia. And we were managing Asia. And Chris was not getting any love from Pearl at the time, which was a shame because he'd been with them quite a while. So I knew John Good at Drum Workshop and uh, I can't remember how I actually met him, but it was through, could have been actually through Mickey D even, you know, mm. um, using the hardware. And anyway, I knew John Good. So I called John up and I said, Chris is looking for a new deal. Would you be willing to help him out? And he said, bring him up, come up, Adam. We'll go for for lunch at Olive Garden as he always John Good does every day. Olive Garden up near in uh, Oxnard, and uh, basically he gave gave Chris a new a new deal and uh, a new kit and everything else. And he's talking to me, and of course I'm a drum nut, so I'm talking to him about all this hardware and ideas and woods and all this sort of stuff. Thinking it's you know, uh, and uh, he's very. Uh, very interesting what I'm saying. So he's, you know, we're having this great conversation. He said, why aren't you playing? I said, well, I don't know. I've not got time. I'm, you know, I'm into I'm managing bands. I'm doing all this stuff. He said, well, I'll, I'll do you a great deal on a kit if you want to get a kit. So I've got my, literally, I'm staring at it now, my uh, White Marine Pearl drum workshop that uh, John Good sold me. And um, I had four drums I'd kept from the 80s. Um, right. Two of them are here. That's just three of them at two. Three of them are on this rack, and Amazing. one of them is in, is, is in with another thirty odd drums in my closet. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so basically, yeah. And then from then on, I got a Roland electronic kit and started playing. And I totally re-evaluated my whole outlook on drums. It was about the groove. It was about the just timing. You know, I was playing for I'd play for five minutes, just boom, 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 boom. boom, boom, boom. You know, and it's not that easy to do when you when you want to when you want to fill, you know, and just yeah. doing that and just so so my you know so that's kind of and I but I was playing in a couple of cover bands in LA and uh, you know and it wasn't really until lockdown, um, even though I'm 
still as busy as ever doing what I do in my bands. I started, you know, I moved into this house about four years ago and I started this, I, I had this, I've always had a room where I've put drums in it, but I've got, it's not, I'm actually totally running out of space. It looks like a sort of a, a very sort of cramped music store here, but I, I love coming in here. It makes me feel good. It, uh, it just, you know, and I can, I've got, couple of kits one kit with pads on it one with a full-blown kit an electronic kit um, all my snare drums cymbal setups everything you know Brilliant. and it, and it's a great hang and i just i'm just a drum nut i just love drums i think they they make me happy you know yeah i think um that's a common story for a lot of guys um I think you're very fortunate to be to be able to have somewhere to store them all i think that's a problem that a lot of people have um, well, including myself, I, I own quite a few drum kits, but unfortunately, there's nowhere where I can have an acoustic kit set up where I live. I do ha luckily have an electric kit. Um, and then I got a few kits in cases in my garage, which I don't think is ideal. Uh, the temperature well, uh, and the moisture and stuff. But um, to be honest with you, Dane, you need two or three snare drums and one kit. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah. That, 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 that's really I I have a disease and I admit it. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's an addictive uh, you know, yeah. yeah, you know, but I started getting, you know, I've got, I'm staring at six Ludwig kits, three Vist, <laughs> three Vista lights, a uh, a sixty four white marine pearl, um, a six, a sort of a mid sixty champagne sparkle, and a, and a silver sparkle. I've got three big R Rogers, one in white, black, and blue, and I've got a red bass drum in the closet. Why do I need? three big R kits because they're different colors and they look good. I've got five Slingerland kits. I've got a 62 Gretsch Jasper set shell Gretsch with the um, uh, silver uh, painted in, in interior round badge here. A shadow up there, which is a, oh, a wow. double base kit. Most of my, most of my kits are 22, 13, 16. Um, Cause that's what I play. And I've got, and I've got my two drum workshop kits in front of me here. And, you know, I, um, I it just makes me happy. So I, I, I am extremely lucky. And I know a lot of people that just come in here and they just freak out when they see it. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I know guys that have got two or three snares and one kit and they love it as much as I do. Yeah. And that's all that matters. Exactly. I'm also a big practice pad guy. I've got a huge collection of practice pads. I love noodling on a pad. I love it. I've got a. I've got my brand new prototype um, pad here from a friend from a friend of mine uh, called Colin Hillborn. Colin was uh, a roadie for Elton John and the Faces back in the seventies, and he had a company called Prentice Practice, Practice Pads. He built these hand built practice pads in America, and he's coming up with this new thing. And I've got the the world's first prototype here. Wow. And I've been playing it and uh, it's really, really cool. So, yeah, I, you know, but I've got pads all over the place. I've got in every room in the house. I've got a practice pad and a pair of sticks. That's fantastic. Um, I don't know if you saw my, <laughs> my post from a few days ago. I, I decided to get my pad out. I only own one pad. I haven't used it for months. And I decided, right, I'm going to bring it into the house. I'm going to put a football on and I'm going to practice on the practice pad while I watch the football. Because normally... I, well, I've never really found much enjoyment in practice pad work, but it's because I've never had any exercises to focus on, I suppose. I kind of, I, I use them on tour sometimes to warm up in the dressing room, but that's, it's literally just warming my hands and my arms up. But I don't really think about what I'm doing on them. So I think that's one area of my playing now I really want to concentrate on. And I think it'll, I'll find the benefit in my kit playing once I've, Found some things to work on and proper exercise. Dane, to, to be honest with you, I'm a huge. I've got a. I've got a bunch of influencers on YouTube that I watch. You know, um, these guys like Mike Johnson, guys like um, Rob Brown. You know, these guys are absolutely phenomenal purveyors of the art to the general public through YouTube. There's a whole bun bunch of them. I mean, a whole bunch of these guys. Yeah, and. You know, I, I, I don't have, I haven't had cable TV since 2013. I use Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon Prime. That's all I watch, plus YouTube. Yeah. 
be- best money I ever spent was getting YouTube Premium, where all the ads had gone. So, you know, oh, you've got I, that, I, yeah. oh yeah, 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 because I because I watch it so much and I watch these channels. You know, I mean, I don't have a lot of time. I'll be honest with you, I'm extremely busy. But when I do at night, when I want to relax, instead of watching putting TV on, I will put YouTube on, and I sit with my pad and my sticks, and I pull my pad up, and I'm literally just doing singles. Yeah. You know, doubles. Yeah. You know, um, and you're doing that, and it kind of it's muscle memory, you know, and um, and it just I started having drum lessons again last September from Brilliant. a guy called Gary Ferguson. Now Gary was Gary Moore's drummer in the uh, '87 Run for Cover era. He nice. played. He's, he's, he was Eddie Money's drummer in the early '80s when Eddie had his big hits. He was. He played with Cher, Living Newton John. He's a te- he's a uh, a teacher he's an absolutely phenomenal um teacher and person and drummer i mean you know he totally blows me away i come up with anything i could come up with anything you know uh, it's like talking to him i had a lesson last night actually and uh i said to him uh, you know we were talking about ian pace and fireball you know because i was i bought, bought that up and he said oh i'll learn that from the next lesson and we can go through it. And I'm like, okay, you know, and he, and he like will do. I mean, you know, I can pull up anything. I can say, Steve Jordan's doing this sort of groove. And he'll go, well, this is how he's doing it. Now, to me, it takes me a year to work it out, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, but he, and he puts it onto a pad and he sort of do this on the pad. Because it's all, it's all singles and doubles. It's all singles and doubles. Yeah, I guess everything all, is. Yeah, everything yeah, is. It, yeah, yeah. You know, if it's a power diddle, it's it's you know two two doubles and a single, alternated. If it's uh, you know, um, it's either quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, thirty second notes. If you can feel it, you don't count it. And singles and doubles. Once you've got that down, and you can count, that's it really. Yeah. And it's just getting it's just getting the four limbs to do. What the what what you want the four limbs to do, which yeah. is the hard part. But Gary is so I started having these lessons, and Gary's like, just do all this stuff on the pad, and then play what you want, play what you normally play on the kit. Just when you get around the kit, just play what you want to play. Don't think about the pad. And I've it's been what five months, a month off over Christmas. I have a lesson every two weeks. Yeah, and I can absolutely feel my improvement in my playing on my kit. I mean, absolutely. And it's just, and I'm doing, you know, just, uh, just coordination be- and between all the limbs. And even though I'm using that my hand on the pad, not not my feet, we're kind of doing, you know, we're doing this alternate sort of rhythms on the feet to the hands, and you know, this sort of odd time stuff. And it's based on very simple rudiments. And it's absolutely phenomenal. And Gary's, I, I have to give a big shout out to Gary Ferguson. Yeah. He's, a, he's just an amazing guy and, uh, you know, doing me a world of good. Really, yeah, he sounds like the man for you as well. And um, yeah. if, if you've yeah. seen an improvement, that's great. And I think that's important for anyone looking for a teacher that I've heard as well. It's not, sometimes maybe try a few different ones until you find the right teacher for you. Um, I don't have a lot of experience in that area. I, I've, I, I did have a few lessons years ago. Well, four or five years ago with a guy in Cardiff, more of a jazz drummer, amazing drummer, amazing teacher. He teaches at like the Royal Welsh College in Cardiff and stuff. So he's amazing. But I went to him specifically because I'm, I suppose I'm a rock drummer. That's all I've ever played all my life. I was like, I want to learn other things. I want to open up my That's world, the my technique. And yeah, I learned, I learned quite a lot from him. But at the time it was when I was, I think I was in three bands. I was working a full-time job. I didn't, I didn't put the time in to practice what he was showing me. And then the next week we'd move on to something else and I hadn't quite nailed what we'd done the previous week. So that's my fault. And I actually went through, I've still got all the printouts that he used to give me or he used to send me and I used to print them out from all the, the, I guess the, exercises and things like that. And I've still got the folder full of them. So I went through that the other day to find out, oh, maybe I can get a few, a few ideas to use on this practice pad. And, and yeah, it's just that I didn't put the time in. So I think you've got to find the right teacher, which I think he was the right teacher for me. It's just, I didn't dedicate enough time to it, which is a shame well, looking back. I wanted to get, you know, I mean, I love brushes. I love the brushes. And Gary's a great brush player. 
um, I wanted to learn Brazilian rhythms, the bossa novas, the sambas. Samba, you know. yeah. uh, I wanted to, you know, the son claves, the, you know, the, the bow did, did, diddly beat, you know. Yeah. Da, 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 da. You know, Rolling Stones, you know, it's that. And just doing that sort of underlying. So what, what I chose, when I chose Gary, and I kind of came across him totally by accident, but, uh, you know, I obviously knew who he was from the 80s with, Gary Moore. Um, I was a huge Gary Moore fan back in the 80s. So, um, and it be, you know, I wanted somebody that wasn't just a rock guy. I wanted somebody that, that knew. And of course, there's, you know, there's some amazing rock guys out there that do know all this. I mean, Russell Gilbrook. I mean, what a, oh. what a, what a player. Really? You know, Brian, Brian Tishy. I mean, what a, you know, the, the, these guys can play rock uh, as, as good, if not better than anybody else. And they also know the technical side of they can do it you know it's they 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 know the art of drumming it's about the art of drumming it's not just about playing a beat you know like we we're talking i was talking to gary yesterday and about you know because he's a big funk funk drummer we we're listening to clyde stubblefield james brown's drummer you know yeah, yeah. and uh, and then steve jordan and dennis chambers two guys that i've just literally now i'm really watching a lot of you know and steve's and we're going through a lot of steve jordan beats and Steve's just, oh my God, they're just the groove. Oh man, it's just Incredible, like, you know, yeah. you know, and, and you, d you know, guys like Jason Sutter, who's a, who's plays with Cher at the moment. He was with Foreigner. He was with Marilyn Manson. Oh, wow. Have you heard, if you go to Jason Sutter brushes on YouTube and what do you watch his brush, brush playing, you would, unbelievable, unbelievable. Wow. And, you know, so, and you know, I, I just love, I love guys that can play the drums. It's not just about playing a beat or playing rock. It's about the drums are so much more. And I was just, you know, even though I read Modern Drummer back in the 80s and I watched and I looked at these guys and I was kind of intrigued by them. It was about, you know, uh, how am I going to get my drum kit upside down to beat Tommy Lee on the next tour? You know, it was kind of that, you know, and... And it was a shame, you know, I, I remember I went in the, in the studio and I went in with these huge big bass drums and it's like, you know, I remember the last time I went in the studio in the 80s, I went to, to record a single. I took in a 20 inch kick, a, a 12 rack, 14 floor and played the thing. And it's, and it, you know what, it it's came out so much better than this huge, massive Tom double bass kit that I used to bring in. It's like, you know, I couldn't really play the things that, that, that well, you know, I was just, I was, it was about the show and it was about being on the road and being in a band. And, but ultimately, you know, I say to people, people say, oh, I, I, I can't afford a drum kit. Buy a pad and a pair of sticks. Buy stick control and buy syncopation by Ted Reed. There you go. That's all you need. The four things, you know. That's um, yeah. you, you know, you know, I mean, for $50, you can buy that all. You can go on to you know, uh, Amazon now and get a pad, a stand, a pair of sticks and the two books for $50. Just sit with that. Get a teacher, though. Don't try stick, stick control on your own. No. Don't try and w learn it. It's a complete waste of time. You know, I had to, I've got an original copy of stick control from 85 in my, uh, you know, well, I say original. The book was written in 1932, but I've got an older copy. And then I bought one in 2005 and that's all beat to you know literally it's all dog-eared and it's uh, there's all the notes in it and that's what we you know with that book is the bible for drums and it is i thought oh it's just dots it's boring it's just on the snare there's nothing else but when you take that and you apply it to what yes. you want to do it covers everything you know dane you well, know you're a drummer you know well and obviously you know I try, yeah. I try, <laughs> I try, but yeah, I, de I definitely need to play more. And when I play more, I notice that I'm better than when I go weeks without playing. And it's more to do with, yeah, muscle memory, definitely. But just ideas, you get better ideas the more you, you play. So I'm going to try and like, I, the thing with me, this is what I'm going to ask you. You said you've got two, two acoustic kits and an electric kit in front of you. Is that because depending on what time of day it is, or is it sometimes you just fancy you go on the electric kit or because you want to play along to some music on your headphones? What? Um, well, I've got, I've got um, my, I'm just going to, I'll show everybody. What yeah, yeah anyone who's watching okay. on YouTube. Okay. So well, basically, this is my drum workshop uh, collector series uh, in uh, Black Gloss. 
Beautiful. I've got there, I've got my um, white green pearl, which is my 2005 kit. And there's my Roland TB20 electronic kit. Okay. Yeah. So the, I'll just pull this back around. Sorry. That's okay. So um, the Black Gloss Drum Workshop, I, uh, I'm actually playing with Ricky at the moment and i and i and i got that um to basically play with him uh it would i hadn't had a drum workshop kit for 15 years and i thought it was time to get a new one and um classics are classic sizes 22 14 13 9 16 16 nice. i've got this ready to go i've got actually the i've got a mapex tomahawk snare which is my new undiscovered gem of a snare drum it's um i'll tell you about that in, in a bit but yeah i have that with a uh with a silent stroke head on it uh, ah, i've never tried those the, yeah well the trouble is they're like a trampoline um so the, you you literally drop the stick and you have to catch it up here ah. you know because um but i and I, I bought a set for some videos that we're doing with ricky warwick and um they're great, but they just bounce too, too much, you know, but they, but listen, they are really good alternative to making a lot of noise. Yes. But what I've, but what I've got on this one, I've got some Vic first rubber pads on the, on the real heads, on the bass drum and on the toms, they sound great. And I've got the silent stroke on the snare because the pad on the snare doesn't work that well. Um, so that is my, so, and I've got these Wuhan ORA um, low volume symbols, the ones with the holes in them. Ah. And a great friend of mine, Mark Tirabassi from Hubbard Music in the USA, um, he's the Wuhan distributor in the States, hooked me up with a set of these symbols. And of course, Zildjian and, um, uh, Zildjian and Sabian make a set of low volume. They're just basically symbols with holes in them. Yeah, I've seen, see. the, I've seen the Zildjian ones before. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. No, I've never seen so, no Wuhan made them. That's yeah, great. yeah. Well, well uh, and the w Wuhan ones are at a lot better price point and they sound great. They sound really cool. And so I use that on this kit. And this is because the electronic kit's really good. The electronic kit is great when I've got my headphones on and I'm listening to a song and I'm learning a song. Yeah. But I need to put it on a real kit. So if it's during the day, I've, I've got a bit of space between the neighbors. The neighbors can hear the drums, but I play for 20, 25 minutes on the real kit, full volume. Mm. I, use ear, I use earplugs now. These eargasm earplugs, which are just awesome because they cut the volume down yeah. uh, whilst retaining the sound you know they're not like a foam ear pad an earplug sorry where you can't you cut out everything so uh because i'm very you know i must admit after 10 years with motorhead you know your, your hearing can be a bit dodgy uh, yeah <laughs> so so uh, a little bit yeah so uh you, you know i i do play i have the the uh white marine pearl kit set up with with coated emperors on it full full symbols set up and that's the one i blast away on this one here i just take because when i go out when i need the kit to go into rehearsal with, with ricky or whatever i just take the pads off put a real snare with it i've got a couple of snares bagged up out there uh, that i use with the kit and then the electronic kit as i say great for learning you put your song through your headphones and sounds great you know i mean that yeah. kit's 15 20 sorry 15 16 years old now i think and it was the top of the range when I got it. They've of course got they've of course improved everything since then, but it works great for me. And it's and because the thing with electronic kit is they'll never take it out, out of your space because things will go wrong with it. You know, if you start taking it into rehearsals, taking it to gigs, it's gonna start going wrong, you know. So yeah, I, I don't trust it. that. Yeah, yeah. I, I know there's people that do take electric kits to like pub gigs and stuff. And I number one, I always think it sounds terrible and then but yeah for me it's just like it's 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 harder more difficult for me to pack it away set it back up in a pub pack it away again bring it home and set it back up absolutely and, absolutely yeah. and i prefer just to have a kit in my garage ready to go in cases it's much easier for me but yeah um but well, well, you, know, was, just, you know just 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 play if you need a lower volume kit just play just play lighter play yeah. with rods play with you know, blast sticks, or they used to be called the plastic, you know, rod stick thing. Yeah, um, they're, they're pretty you know, cool. You know, just play with lighter sticks. If you're using two Bs, play with five As at that, you know, and you and you'll be like, and the yeah. volume will be down. 
Or get, yeah, smaller symbols is a good thing. Exactly. Which I've noticed. I don't have many small ones. <laughs> All mine are like 20 inches or something like that. But yeah, what what I was going to say was, like, I much, I enjoy playing an, an acoustic kit so much more than an electric kit. And I think if I had that room with a real drum kit in, especially with my, like, my nice drums, I do own some nice drums, I'd just be more inclined to go and spend time practicing but when I know my only option is the electric kit, and like you said, it, like you said with the silent stroke pad, I imagine it feels similar to a mesh pad on an electric kit with the bounce. It, yes, it's different. Yes, yes. Well, but it's but it even it's you know I have my I have my snare tuned pretty high, right? Um, and of course, and I use the mesh the silent stroke head tuned kind of similar feel, but it just I mean it, listen it's. It's still from when I started. When I started playing, um, I had rubber pads. When I was in my flat in London in the mid '80s, um, and I had a kit set up there, and I had these rubber pads on it. I had to put towels over the symbols, yes. and you know, and the pads that I had then just—I don't know—they didn't seem to be uh, res responsible. Not these Vic fur things. They just—they, I mean. They're just very simple, you know, cool. um, things. But they, but the way they, the way they sit on these drums and the way they sound. I mean, the, I mean, the mesh heads sound good. I mean, there's a friend of mine called Ian Palmer um, who um, does a uh, um, does a podcast. Um, does sorry, does a not a podcast, a Facebook live thing once oh, a yeah. week. Okay. And Ian's a, a sort of a jazz drummer, um, really by trade, but he but he's plays everything great drummer and he has a yamaha kit set up in his uh in his house because he lives in a town townhouse and he can't um i don't know ian that well i only know him through literally the internet but we kind of communicated and, and uh he uh he has um silent stroke and zildjian l80s which are their low volume symbols and he makes them sound i mean i love the sound of them i mean it's again it's like you know playing you know if you it's all about how you play it you know yeah you can have is. a two you can have a 200 pound drum kit with cheap heads on it and if you're benny greb it's gonna sound amazing yeah. you know you know there's, there's I mean, definitely videos ever, out, there's definitely yeah. videos out there like that isn't it he's playing well, like well, a chi you, child's drum kit exactly do yeah. you see benny on the i mean i play a child's drum kit and it's yeah <laughs> you know i mean i can't even get it a, get a sound out of it you know he's just so it's all about you know what comes from here to here yeah to the, to the drum yeah and it doesn't really matter so but as i say ian uses these silent stroke heads and these low and it sounds i mean i'm totally i i love the sound listen you can't beat an acoustic drum let's no, face it no know? no i mean roland started making electronic kits with real drum size with kind of bigger drum sizes so it yeah. looks like you know and when Pearl brought out those things that Tommy Lee started using on the last Motley Crue tour before they split up, before they reformed again, <laughs> um, uh, you know, he used those Pearl electronic things because, you know, he needed it for whatever he was doing in that. I mean, it's just not this. Listen, come on, you know, John Bonham, Buddy Rich. I mean, yeah. it's just, <laughs> you know, you just can't beat it. You know, no, you can't. and so so this is why I've got the three set up. Yeah, you're right. It's, if it's two o'clock in the morning, I I won't play my full acoustic set. Yeah, um, you know, and I I kind of play that till eight o'clock at night. You know, more not normally during the day if I've got a bit of time or if it's a weekend. You know, normally mm. during the day I'm in the office all day. But um, and then the one with the pads on it and the mesh heads, um, I kind of that can go up to 10, 11 o'clock at night. It's not too loud. And then if it's two in the morning, you know, or um, I play the electronic kit, but also right. electronic kit's really cool because you can, because you can hear, you know, even if I put my headphones on and play my iPod with a track and I'm playing the acoustic kit, um, I can hear the, the um, real acoustic kit through it, but the one with the rubber pads on, I can't even hear it. Oh, right, because yeah. of course you know the headphones are. so it, it's great it's just they for di different things different know. things yeah and it's good just to whack the click track on and the metronome or whatever if you're exactly exactly that's exactly. what i use mine for a lot for and just always like, practice with a me with yes. a metronome always yes definitely I, apparently I, apparently if, if you're at berkeley or if you're at uh uh one of the 
if you're not walking around with a metronome, if you're playing a drum and there's not a metronome going off, you're, you're thrown out. <laughs> That's what I heard, yeah. No, 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 yeah, probably, we'll see. <laughs> um, let's, let, let's talk a little bit more about your collections. I know, like, I, I've had my, not with collecting drums, I've, I do own more drums than I need, so I guess maybe I do have a little issue there. How many, how many kits I, do you have? Oh, wow. Well, I've got, currently, I got one. Maybe seven, maybe it's respectable, but I don't, I don't need seven. But um, one of one was a recent acquisition, which I said, if I buy this, I'm going to sell one of the other ones. But it is hard. You have sent, you get sentimental <laughs> with these things, don't you? Because the the one I wanted to sell was the one I recorded our last album on, and I'm thinking. I bought this new one to replace that. But I'm like, oh, well, I did the last album with that. And it did sound really good, but I'm not going to use it live. I haven't got any room in the studio or my brother's studio to keep it set up. They're just in cases in his storage room, which he, he reminds me about that. Oh, yeah, you've got a drum kit up there. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but at the moment, and like, and I like, I'm finding excuses not to sell it. Like at the moment, the market is a bit of a buyer's market, apparently. Well, it is. Because I just know it's worth more than what I get for it right now, so I'm like, maybe I should hold on to it. Um, well, well it. I've I've sold a, I've sold a few, when back in the in '91 I sold all my gear. I had a Black Shadow nine um, piece kit back then, and I sold it um, to a drum shop. I you know, and then I had a I had a, a deal with Remo. I was playing Remo heads and Remo drums in the late. Ah. 80s cool. and uh, no it was stupid i was ah. i had i no, i mean i mean i mean the drums were good they were the acoustic on shells you know which was the ba basically paper mache shells <laughs> let's face it and uh, but the the bass drums were 24 by 24 oh. the toms were 13 by 13 14 by 14 16 by 16 not a huge kit only a six piece kit two bases two racks one floor but the bass drums were, what the hell was I thinking? Somebody yeah. should have just slapped me around the head then and gone, what are you thinking? But anyway, um, you know, I like a 14 inch, I, 14 maximum 16 inch bass drum. I've got a Mapex kit at the moment, which is a 20 inch kick with a 18 inch depth that I'm trying to sell at the moment. It's a Good. great, great kit. I'm getting rid of it quite reasonable. I've got a couple of other little things, but um, my collection of it's not just vintage, as you say at the beginning. It's you know I've got a new, I've got a lot of new stuff as well. Yeah, it's it's just great. You know I'm staring at a 1960s Rogers Luxor that I recovered in yellow. I use it's a six lug. The Luxors were the cheaper end drums, uh, but what happened in the in the um, 60s and 70s? The cheaper end drums just had less hardware on them. This is where you got a six log snare, not an eight or ten log snare. The shells that, were the same, right? Shells, shells were the same. Yeah, if you look at Premier, Premier Olympic shells, sorry, Premier Club shells, for instance, compared to you know, of course, the resonators had their internal um, um, shell design in them, and the sound wave had had slightly smaller shells. You know, where the head sat over it, like more of a timpani type thing. Right. But but ultimately, you know. It, these were the days prior to where Taiwan really came in and started making cheaper shells um, for cheap drums. So the the in the 60s, you know, like where this Rogers drum is from, um, it was the same shell as on all the other kits, you know. So Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so um, all those snare drums behind you then, do you, mm. are they there? So do you, do you look, is there to look at or do you ever stick them on the kit? Always, every, okay. every single one, every single You're one. The, 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 the only drums that I haven't played, I'll be honest with you, I've got four engraved Black Beauties right at the back there, um, which I can actually, I'll just show you. What yeah. If you look sure. right over the back there. You see those four drums there? You see them? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. That's, um, I don't play them because I have the same equivalent in non-engraved models. And I just don't want to, they, they are purely, they're things of beauty. Yeah. You know? um, um, there's a 1993 um, a floor design. There's a 2005 scroll. There's a 100th anniversary, 2009 scroll. And there's a 2019, 110th anniversary that I bought 
because they didn't make an engraved Black Beauty in 2019, <laughs> so I got John Aldridge to engrave that with a 1929 floor design on it. And it's phenomenal. I just love it. But uh, this is my Ludwig um, sort of stand here. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of, I've got, uh, <laughs> and that's a, that's a 19, 1980 uh, Black, Black Beauty. That's a super sensitive. You see the, with the big strainer across the bottom. There. Yeah, I've got, I've got um, a, I, you probably know more than, a lot more than me. I've got a 410, is that right? With the, with the, the super strainer, is that a 410? Um, could, be, could be a 410. Obviously the 400, 402s, the 553s five, five I've got. I kind of know the numbers of the ones I've got. I yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. There probably is a 410, yeah. yeah, somewhere. That's how they, uh, but um, they did the superphonic, which is just a normal throw off. And then the super sensitive has the, has the, um, has the full length sort of drop down, like the Rogers Dynasonic sort of yeah. edge, you know. The ones but, you can't get cases for them, they're a pain in the exactly, ass. Exactly, cases. exactly. Well, this is, this is the same. This is why this never goes. This, this, to be honest with you, um, I bought it in 1990 off a guy called John Shearer. It used oh, right. to belong to Pete Kersher, who was who was Quo's drummer. Oh, cool. Um, this was that, that, that was his. That's uh, nice to know. But, but, but I've got some new drums. These are my two, two new, two of my new. Favorite ones. This is a British drum company, Merlin Snare. Ah, oh, they're meant to be beautiful, aren't they? Oh, yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous. Sounds great. And this here, I've got it. I haven't got the badge showing, but this is a. Let me just move this out of the way. Sorry. You see this one here? This red one? Yeah, yeah. This is a um, William F. Ludwig the Third, Bill Ludwig, who was the um, the grandson of. Um, of William Ludwig Sr., who started Ludwig Drums. He started his own drum company about five, four or five years ago. Um, and mm. uh, this is the old three-ply um, maple, popular maple shell that yeah. Ludwig made here back in the 60s. And he, and this, 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 this just sounds amazing. I just, I just love it. Um, it's got that mm. classic Ludwig sound. And he, I bought he, they were like a stain, but he did a gloss for me, and it just looks looks amazing. And I yeah. love that drum. So yeah, but a British drum company are one. Um, when I when I saw Russell Gilbrook's kit because he started endorsing them when he was in the studio um, doing the last Uriah right Heap album, I was totally blown away. And uh, I I've got an, I've got I use Drum Workshop. I love Drum Workshop. I'm a huge fan they treat me very well the people there are great and john's just a total god when it, in the in the drum world to me so um but if i didn't use drum workshop british drum company will probably be the the, the one that i would Ryan. go go towards yeah if i was playing that you know but uh but yeah i've got uh you know they just the, the the kits are really just um thing that i that i want of course i want more kits i mean there's always stuff out that i see you know uh, I've got three kits in England. I've got a 1969 Heyman gold ingot, which is the George Heyman badge from the original year. And I've got two premier kits, a 1980 Soundwave Mark I and a 1982 Soundwave Mark II. Wow. Um, and actually, there's a bit of an interesting story to that one. Um, I posted something on the premier page. Oh, God, uh, this was last Feb, Jan, Feb time, before pandemic. And... Uh, I said, what's your favorite premier kit? If you could have any premier kit. Well, mine was the Black Shadow, which I've got up here. Because I sold my original Black Shadow in 1990, 1990 to, again to John Shearer at, at his drum shop. And then a friend of mine, Scott Chirilla, who played in Rev Reverend Horton Heat, oh, yeah. um, had this kit. He'd had it for about seven or eight years and he wanted to sell it. And he sold it to me. And I think he's actually re regretted selling it, bless him. Because he keeps mentioning it all the time. But uh, I, <laughs> this is a mean condition. Mine had 24-inch kicks. This has 22s. But it's got, this is a 12, 13, 14, 15, four racks across the top, 16, 18 floor in the resonator black shadow finish, which are birch shells, you know. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, Absolutely phenomenal kit. I'm never getting rid of that kit. That's just, that's that's a replacement for the idiocy of me back in 1990 selling my kit. When exactly, I, yeah. 
you know, and that's why you should never sell your kits because you'll always regret it. I know. Uh, I need, but, I need but, a room like yours. <laughs> So, uh, and then I actually, I've actually got the snare to that. You see that snare there? Oh, beautiful. This is, this is this. I had to, I had to, that didn't come with the kit, but I bought this from a guy in England and brought it back to the States from him. That's my vintage drum pedal cabinet. You see uh, yeah. That? Wow. Oh, so they're all like vintage models. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You, well, well, up to like the, to, and I've got a, in my closet, I've got a bunch of snares and some more kits. I've got a 19, uh, 63 club date which is 2012 14 silver sparkle i've got a, a few other things in there a bunch of snares but this has got cam, camco pedals drum workshop original drum workshop 5000s two of them oh, nice. um two slinger lands uh a, a, an old tama well an old tama from the 70s uh, a sonar pedal there a ludwig speed king a slinger land pedal and uh yeah, a couple of other things, but anyway, that's that was just kind of a, a cool thing that I started uh, acquiring pedals, and I like that. So why not yeah. do it? Why not? <laughs> so, like, before we move on, then, so what makes you decide I'm going to buy that? Like, do, do you go looking for specific things that you like really want, or is it just you see something pop up? Oh, well, I was random. I was, let, let me so i was to go back to the premiere post on facebook so i yeah. said what's your favorite kit and mine was i said mine's two i've got two favorite premiere kits one's a um uh one is a uh, black shadow and one is a, a 1982 sound wave uh in the tri-band which was the red and natural wood tri-band finish now the 1982 sound wave premiere catalog had this on the front of the catalog Nice. Uh, and, I've, and I've got it over there some, somewhere anyway um, but um, the uh, so some guy said and I said I've already got the black shadow when I can find the sound wave then I'm going to buy one so some guy said well there's one at the moment in Glasgow on eBay <laughs> so and Premier Drums are speak to Bob Richards you know who's obviously yeah. a huge Premier um, he's selling something at the moment i think a big big white one i don't know what he it is. is yeah yeah he is yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he is he's, he's already uh yeah and if i if i had more if i had another house in england like i have here i would <laughs> uh, i would i would i'll be buying it off him but um the uh anyway i said i wanted this sound wave and pacific driver and this guy said well there's one on ebay at the moment so i basically um got hold of the guy i uh, uh bought it from him and uh um he was telling me that because there was when i was in nottingham there was a music store i used to frequent all the time called carlsborough sound and that's where i bought my first black shadow and bought all my drum gear and but there was another music store in nottingham on a place called market street sorry let me turn my phone off that's all right a bit beeping um and um they um there was a, a premier sound wave kit like on the front of the catalog in that store in on market street in nottingham in 1982 now i i was wanting my I'd, at this point i was wanting a double bass kit this was a single kit 13 14 racks because they that's how they did them last time 16 floor and it was anyway so i just fell in i just I've always loved that kit. It was on, on the brochure. When you're a kid, you get the brochures and, you know, and you, yeah. and you take them to bed with you and all that stuff. <laughs> so um, anyway, you, so... You might have. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? You know, what, what, yeah, what, I what, what, what I'm saying is it was, it was reading material at night. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, yeah, anyway, of course. You know. Yeah, no, yeah. You know. um, uh, but so uh, then we... Um, so anyway, I'm talking to this guy online and, I'm, and I bought his kit. And he said, you know, I said, oh, it's coming back to Nottingham. I said, and, I, and to be honest, it's still in Glasgow at the moment. A friend of mine storing it for me. Oh, wow. um, he went and picked it up and stored it because I've not been over there since the pandemic started. And uh, so anyway, I'm talking to him. I said, it's going back. I said, oh, I, I was in Nottingham at uni. In fact, I bought that kit from this music store on Market Street in 1982. I'm the, I'm the original owner. So that was the kit that I saw in the window. What? Yeah, so th that kit that I saw it that I wanted in 1982 and never got because I wanted a double bass drum kit by then. And the next year I bought the Black Shadow. And of course, I didn't have the money to be buying more than one kit at a time. You know what I mean? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah, so I've got that kit back now, you know. And there's another kit that uh, Jack Taylor 
uh, who's a drummer in Tax the Heat, who we managed, and he works for Siren. Is a, is a, I found a guy in South, in fact, Bob went and picked it up for me, a Mark I Soundwave, which is um, got the, not got the, the lug plinths on them. Sorry, I'm getting very technical here, but... Yeah, uh, for the non, uh, non-drummers yeah, yeah, might yeah, be... Yeah, 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 that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, but uh, um, this is, a, a, again, a tri-band kit in sort of brown and gold. And I saw it and the guy was selling it with cymbals, with snare drum, with hardware for an incredibly good price. I couldn't pass it up. And it was in South Wales. I said to Bob, I said, Bob, can you do me a favor? Can you jump in your car and go and fetch this kit? So it's stored at the moment at Jack Taylor. So when I get over to the UK in the next, hopefully three or four months, I can do a big trip trip around and pick up all these drums. Nice. That'll be fine. Well, will you bring them back to the States with you then? No, I'm going I'm to leave them over there for the yeah. moment. Um, I've got a house at the moment. Um, but when I, if I ever sell that house, then uh, I've got a house that um, my mother used to live in. That uh, right. is basically, you know, uh, is where I keep all my stuff. So, and then when I do sell that, I'll then ship them back. Yeah. Yeah. But, I uh, you know, but, but until then, there's about five snare drums over there, various snares and three kits. So. Cool. Yeah. Great. So yeah, well, I'm sure everyone who is listening to this is uh, kind of in awe, a little bit jealous probably, but it's really, <laughs> it's really interesting and it's amazing. And um, thanks for sharing your collection. My pleasure, Dane. And I'm, and I'm sorry I go on about it, but it really no. is. It's, it, it is my passion, you know. It's, it's, cool. it's well, like, you know. well, I hope the majority of people who listen to this, hopefully drums are their passion as well. I know there are a few mm. non-drummer listeners. So um what we'll talk about now is obviously some of the other stuff you've been involved in. All, all I know really that you were you were a tour manager for Motorhead for was it about ten years? And was there well, any other other positions you had with other bands before? Yeah, that? well, well, what it was, I was my a brief history. I was I was playing drums in the eighties. I stopped in eighty nine, and I started a management company. Um, well, I started in a management company and then I started an agency to kind of bring instant money in to fund the management company. Right. So I was an agent manager from like 89 to 93, 94. Then I went and worked for one of the big promoters in England, Phil McIntyre, till 97. And then I went back. Now, when I was an agent and, and my manager, I went on the road with quite a few bands then as a tour manager and sort of... and coordinator you know yeah. i would i would bring bands over from america even if they had a t- tm i would kind of go out and oversee the tour from my from the european side you know yeah so um then in 2000 i moved to the states um i was between 97 and 2000 i was out on the road with a few bands i took i was out with slipknot i was out with queens of the stone age i was out with uh, a few other bands you know like that Whoa. and and uh um as a sort of a tm tour co- coordinator sort of thing and then in 2000 i moved to the states and i started managing asia and wanted to really get back into management well then i got a call it was actually about nine years with motorhead 2001 to 2010 was actually the, the period um i got a call to say mode had looking for someone do you want to come and and i was managing asia and i really didn't want to get didn't really want to get back out on the road full time so i kind of i came in and i said i, I said to todd singham and how about i you know i go out on the road with them for a couple of years and get to know them and do the thing as the tm and then we'll get somebody else in and we got um guy called freddie lynn first then eddie rosher you know eddie yeah yeah and uh, so and then for the last sort of six seven years of my tenure with the band i was kind of i was managing all the touring for them right on, on behalf of todd you know yeah. for sigma entertainment so i was kind of i would go out on the road quite a bit and because i i'm very hands-on with my acts i like to go on the road i like to see i like to meet the promoters i like to see what's going on i'm not a guy that just sits in the office for years on end you know um so yeah that was the whole, whole thing with motorhead so it was kind of i was the tour manager i went in as the tour manager to start but i never wanted to be the tour manager per se because i would by that time i'd already kind of gone into management you know if that makes sense i see what you mean so there was like an overlap 
well, you started managing, but then I guess you probably added more bands to the roster. To yeah, because because I, I then I then had Crocus. Um, we had Crocus. We had uh, oh god, we had about half a dozen acts. Um, but Asia was the main act from two thousand to two thousand six. Right. And uh, so, but I was still kind of I went out on the road with Motorhead, and I and I kind of uh, you know was still doing the Asia thing you know as well as and it was hard work managing and being on the road with a band you know yeah, I, mean, I, I, I imagine you know, it's really you know you know so but then when i when eddie came in really as the full-time tm I, I kind of came came out and i worked from the office and I had more time to concentrate and then we formed me and ace trump my business partner formed siren in 2003 and then um so that's 18 years old this year and we've uh Wow. And in two, 2008, I took on Thin Lizzy. Amazing. And then uh, Motorhead finished for me in 2010. And then we've kind of, you know, you can see my roster now. It's an incredible well, roster, yeah. You know, so, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah. So at the moment, obviously, there's not a lot going on with anyone. I, I guess bands are still releasing music. Um, I know Saxon are just doing a covers album, which I think is an interesting choice. Was well, that, that was done because... Saxon of a band, you know, heritage rock acts, classic rock acts, their physical sales are dropping off, you know, it, as is physical around the world. Let's face it, you know, um, the people that were buying, you know, people still buy vinyl, but it's limited runs. It's thousand, two thousand, five thousand. If you if you're a huge act, you know, um, CDs. Um, the distributors are having a problem getting warehouse, you know, because the cost of of warehousing all this physical product mm. compared to digital, which is where the world is is going. Let's face it; yeah. it just makes a lot of this cost of you know cost prohibitive. So there is a lot of um, people, you know, even though there's still rock fans out there that buy physical, it's just diminishing numbers. You know, I don't know people. There's a few people that I know that collect CDs, but most people, I've got all my CDs in boxes in the garage. I've Same. never seen, you know, Same. you know, I mean, you know, and to be honest with you, my advice is sell them now where you can get anything for them. Otherwise it'd be like VHS video cassettes where the charity shops won't even take them for free. Yeah, you that's know, true. You, try, you know, if, if you have a box of VHS video cassettes, take them to a charity store, get out, get out. We don't, we don't want them, you know. Yeah, you yeah. Have to literally throw them in the garbage. So um, it's, you know, so physical's dropping, digital is the rock fraternity are not embracing streaming in the numbers that the pop, the pop, rap, hip hop, EDM sort of crowd is. Um, but saying that the rock fans are older, let's face it, you know, I mean, you know, that when, if you, if you polled, a high school in 1978 to 1982, there'd be, you know, 70% of the kids would be into rock music. Right. Whereas now, if you can get 2% of them into rock music, you know, um, so it's just the, just the generation is coming into, you know, I think that, so the fans that do like rock music are still buying physical, but in less numbers. So, we need to tour with a band like Saxon. We need to tour to sell what a physical product we can. You know, people are streaming. I'm I'm a big advocate of streaming now. If you can't beat them, join them. Please stream as much as you can. Yeah, you yeah. Know, e e you know, even though we're not getting uh, the money from streaming, but it's kind of funny. I mean, Biff was telling me, you know that uh, you know it's a shame because we because we don't make as much money from records as we did back in the day they they didn't make anything back in the day they're still they were still wholly unrecouped all these bands from back in the day if you go back to their original catalog the deals that the managers did back then in perpetuity deals spending through the yank just the amount of money that they spent on making these records on promoting these records which were which 99% of the time was fully recoupable, you know? Yeah. So, uh, well, not mark, not the marketing, but, you know, anything that, you know, you had a limousine, you had, you know, your caviar and moe, you know, it was all, it was all fully re recoupable. So these bands are totally in the hole forever. 
you know, uh, on these things. So at least if they get a hundred grand for an album now and they can do it for 80 and pocket 20, they're making 20 grand, you know, which is yeah. more than they did back then. But it's a whole different, whole different time scale than what it, a whole different generation now to what it was back in the day, you know? And uh, so we needed to, we need to tour. We need to tour to sell records. We can't tour right now. So the next record was supposed to be out February. 2021 the next studio album it's uh almost recorded we've just kind of put it on ice a bit while we've got the uh, inspirations um cover album out yeah. and it was and it was biff's idea to come up with i said we need to do something in the interim biff came up with the idea of doing a cover album which was a great idea yeah and and I don't, i'm not sure whether you've heard it but it's it, it's brilliant it really is phenomenal you know nigel glockler is you know i mean Nigel's a very underrated drummer, very totally. underrated. Totally. Know? And but he really comes through on this, you know. He uh he's um they were they actually recorded it in a manor house just outside York in the old school way, like uh they like Led Zeppelin did at Headley Grange, where the drum kit was in the was in the foyer within the foyer, you know, with all the staircase and everything. And wow. So they they just li- really kind of recorded it virtually live in this in this big manor house and bought bought the mobile recording in recording unit in and just nailed it you know so i'm very happy with that record and uh i think you know it's uh out march the 19th so um you know yeah it should it should do really well but we i didn't want to put out a new studio record yeah um without t- the touring to back it up you know totally i think it is like like you said the tour inside of it is really important with especially the, the, the kind of, her, I know you say the word heritage act or whatever, but yeah, it, it is an important thing. And we, obviously our band, we decided to put the album out anyway, even though our tour was postponed. And yeah, and I am I was in the camp of, I'd rather wait till we're actually on tour, but everyone else wanted to put it out then. Um, oh, listen, you know, we've you've got a captive audience right now that yeah. than anything else that 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 than watch social media and see what's co- coming out. I just, you know, um, we've also the record labels need to survive. You yes, know? that's true. These labels have their deals with the distributors, and remember, the the distributors are trying to get rid of physical product that because it's just too uh, the. It, it just costs too much to store it costs too much to ship it around yeah. digital it, they can make their money from digital by having virtually no costs on it if you yeah. know there is cost but you know but like not, take a percentage you know, of yeah, each yeah, sale yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. I suppose that's how it works. so so they're trying to you know so the labels the especially the indie rock labels have to keep coming up with product to sustain their distribution deal because yeah. that's what it's all based on you know so um, yeah, it's a, this is why, you know, this is why the idea for the Inspirations album came up. It was kind of an interim thing, but I think it also just, you know, puts a different thing into the mix. People are, you know, um, people are going to really dig it. It's a great system, great songs, songs that you wouldn't think Saxon could do justice to. They, they just kill it, you know. Brilliant. And it's, and it's brilliant, you know, hold the line by Toto. Who would have thought? Uh, it's brilliant. Yeah, it's yeah. Brilliant speaking by deep purple i mean they've got paint it black by rolling stones which is my favorite rolling stones song do a great version of that you know and uh they've just put out paperback writer by the beatles as the next sort of single just pre a precursor to the album release you know so it's uh, you know that yeah i mean but i mean when i say heritage i kind of use that purely as a loose term to distinguish against sort of new rock acts but all these acts are putting out new product. Europe, it's it for them. It's about doing a new album every every so often and coming back and being fresh. And Black Star Ride, you know, um, it's about you know ultimately classic rock bands bringing out new product, yeah, which yeah. which the fans seem to love. I mean, the, our fan base, they oh, of course, but Black Star Ride hasn't got a heritage back in the day. They, you know, but they're we're on about to record the fifth album Brilliant. you know and uh, which is which is amazing in this day and age since 2013 the first one c- came out every 
two, two, two and a half years to put a record out. That it's is great. smashing it, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, but I mean, you know, I mean, the same with you guys. I mean, you kind of, you know, the label wants product to be able to keep going, you know, and I, I don't think this, I just think with Saxon, it's something that um, we could have put the album out, but I think it was, it was a good idea to do the covers album now and then wait a, another year for the new album. So the new album's going to be out February 2022 and hopefully we're going to be touring yeah, hopefully. Um, in 2022 to keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, so keep an eye out for that. Anyone, any Saxon fans? I'm sure there are a few Saxon fans um, in my listeners. Hi, I hope you're enjoying this episode of Drum for the Song. I just wanted to briefly interrupt the interview to tell you about my Patreon page, which is a place where you can support the podcast and, of course, support myself. You can um, sign up to one of the three tiers on there. There's one that's £3 a month, one that is £5 a month, and one that is £10 a month. There are loads and loads of exclusive benefits to signing up, including bonus episodes, merch discounts, Christmas card for myself. Um, if you sign up to the top tier, I'll send you a pair of my drumsticks. Um, loads of other stuff, so go check it out. It's patreon.com forward slash drum for the song. And um, another way you could support me if you're interested, if you're not bothered about the Patreon thing, if you go to my official website, drumforthesong.com, you can send a donation via PayPal. So, um, yeah, thanks for watching this and enjoy the rest of the show. Drum for the Song podcast. Yeah, so that's really cool to know that what well, your opinion is that you do actually think people should embrace the stream inside of things. Um, Obviously, a few years back, it was buy it on iTunes. But unfortunately, I think now more people are streaming on Spotify and things like that. They're not even buying the digital versions, which obviously is affecting the the, the, the sales side of things negatively even more. But still, that's the way it's going. So just well, I just don't think it. we can think the same as we did 30 years ago. No, Technology, totally not. Technologies come in. And let's face it, you know... You don't need to buy a record anymore. You you have to. Every time we put a new album out, within two minutes, if not an hour before, it's on YouTube. And YouTube is free to anybody. Yes. It's not like true. Spotify where, where you can do a free Spotify subscription, but it's not like you're paying. You can get YouTube for free. Yeah. And um, so, and if we don't put it out within two minutes of the album being out, some fan's going to do it, going to literally upload it, you know, and so you can monetize these channels, but it, but the monetization of it is not anywhere near what um, what it was back in the day. But again, like I was saying, you know, but like bands that say we, didn't, we don't make any money now compared to what we do, you have to think of it a different way. You record albums cheaper. You know, yeah. you don't you you don't spend four months in the studio coming in once every three days. You know. I mean, you you book it for fourteen days, and you're in there every fucking day. Yeah, you know? long days. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, you know, because you're trying to get the uh, uh, maximum benefit of that time. Uh, so you just have to think of it differently. So it's hard with a lot of bands that really were used to recording albums back in the day. But let's face it, with technology now, with with you know anybody can get a logic or pro tool set up on their computer and it's and it's like but it's like you know anybody can buy a drum or a practice pad it's how you it's how you can get from here to here to the pad to, to make it sound good i don't i mean i would love to learn logic or pro tools i would really i'm, I'm quite interested in it i'm you know i think but it's uh i'm too busy doing what i do i definitely don't want to spread myself too thin Yes. You know, to, and and to, to, to do it well. But I know a lot of people that are, especially drummers that are doing, you know, I mean, especially now you can record, you know, I could, it, if I had the time and I had the, the clients, I could record drums here. Yeah, you know, of course. You know, you know, I mean, you know, and just do, that's what my drum teacher does. He has his little, he has a garage set up as a, as a studio. He does the stuff that he comes out with, Gary, you know, and it's anything, as I say, from Latin to, jazz to funk to rock to anything that you know can you put drums on this 
on this this song I've got for an advert. Here, I'll put drums on it. Sounds just like it would do at the you know at a four thousand dollar a day studio back in the yeah you know, back in the day, in the day. Yeah, yeah yeah when you, you know. You know. So, so I, I just think we've got to look at the whole business a bit differently. I mean, the direct-to-consumer thing, which is what a lot of labels are doing and bands are doing, where they're not distributing physical product, but you can buy through an e-commerce store, a web store. You can buy an, a limited vinyl run or autograph stuff. Or, and you kind of, I think there's going to be more of that. There's going to be more, I'm including merchandise now with record deals giving them more merchandise products because ultimately if we get an advance to do a record we've got to recoup that advance if we yeah. don't recoup that advance it's not doing anybody any favors if if you lose that record deal because you don't recoup you try and get another record deal everybody talks everybody knows the, the numbers you can't smoke and mirrors it any, anymore you know what i mean it is what it is yeah, you know so, point, actually yeah so but so basically i always try and get the advance as low as we possibly need to make a record because the lower the advance the quicker we recoup everybody's happy makes the band look better you yeah. know when when we've recouped it but there's a certain price point that a band needs to record a record yeah don't give me three grand to record a black star riders record <laughs> i'm sorry that's you know we just can't you know that's not even a pay for that's not even pay for Scott's flight over. Yeah, to the States exactly. And then yeah. anything else, you know. So let's let's. Uh, well, he should fly coach actually, but he doesn't anyway. All oh, right, so okay. <laughs> <Another story. laughs> you know, but uh, but uh, it's you know. So you've got to cut your cloth. You, you you've yeah. got to look at look at it. I mean, I I see, you know, remote recording being. I mean, I, I've heard some phenomenal product, which has been where the where the guys have not even been in the same studio together. Mm. You know, where the drummer's recorded his tracks in his house, the guitar player, you know, the singer's gone to the engineer's home studio and done the vocal there and put it all together. And it sounds killer. Yeah. And they and they and you can you can do the album for 25 grand, uh, you know, you know, uh, or, you know, or, or, or whatever, which is not what, you, you know. But of course, depending on what you're going to sell, I'm not saying. I'm going to do a very cheap deal. It's about, it depends on what, on what we, who we want to use for the producer, the producer still to charge their money. Yes. They're not, they're not dropping their prices, you know, Sad, yeah. um, you know, and uh, well, and, but I mean, they're doing good deals. Don't get me wrong, but you know, but there's a certain amount of, I'm not, that sounds bad against producers, but it's not <laughs> meant to sound that way, but you know, you guys that master it, that mix it, that there's all this costs on just the cost of getting everybody together. So remote recording is a big thing to, I think it's great. I think it's a thing to do. And streaming is just, is easier. I mean, let's face it, Dane, where do you play a CD now? I've got my, I'm, I'm looking oh. at my computer. I've got no, I haven't had a CD drive in my computer for, I've had two new computers since my last one with this, with the CD drive. Yeah. Unless, you, uh, unless you pull out your PlayStation and plug it into the, tv and you plug you put your cd in there i don't know any any computers that have cds anymore i don't know anybody it has a car unless the car is over 12 years old that has a um, cd player in it. I don't know. yeah well I, I was about to say <laughs> the, 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 the last time i played a cd was actually last week some guy added me on facebook and he sent me his album um i think he's looking for musicians basically so i said oh, i'll listen to this because he sent me a youtube link of his video and i thought oh this is really good so I, st I stuck that in my CD player, first CD that had been in there for a while. And then I drove to work, listened to it. I thought, oh, this sounds good. And to go back to what we were just talking about, I said, oh, it sounds amazing. Where did you record it? And he said, I re recorded it in my spare room. And I was like, oh, so, well, you did the drums there? Because obviously for me, for me, I've always thought, oh, well, the recording acoustic drums is the, is the problem when it comes to home recording. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's all programmed. So it wasn't actually any real well, drums, programmed well, drums, but it, it made me believe it was a human playing drums. So he must have done it well enough to, to fool me, who was an actual drummer. Um, maybe if I well, listened to it again, I'd notice Well, that. you know, I mean, you know, depending on what sort of music it is, you can, you can sample drum sounds now from anywhere. You can yeah. get that Bonham sound, you can get that Ringo sound, you can get, you know. In fact, one of the things I'm going to do when I've got some time, I'm going to sample all my drums. Yes. So, you know, so, <laughs> that, so that you can have uh, a sample from Adam's drum room, which is what I'm going to be calling it. Yeah. 
there's my logo you see that oh sure wow that's cool um, so um and um so yeah so because i've got 85 odd snares you know and um there's in fact a friend of mine who's a who's a drummer who's an engineer producer um he has a setup at home he calls his acoustic drums at home and again you can't you couldn't tell the d d difference you know he's he's going to come in and we're going to record each one and uh uh, and to, you know, not not too expensive. Just something where if you want to, you know, you, you want to buy a packet, you know, a packet of twenty snares or thirty snares, you can you yeah. can do, do that, you know. And um, so, I mean, you know, and you can literally just tap, and you can if you and obviously if if you, if you have that, if you have that that basic sound, you can then make it sound however you want it. So you can still play. But let's face it, if you're playing a rock gig, you want to bash. Yeah, you know, you know. I mean, you like want to play loud, you know. You, don't, you know, doing this, do you? You know, <laughs> so, so, so that is the problem, I, you know. But yeah, listen, it, you know, I, I'm I'm old school. I, I I like vinyl. CDs were never anything that I really liked. You know, okay, there were nothing. There was nothing sexy about a CD. But then again, I'm older. You know, I'm old enough to be your dad, Dave. I'm almost as yeah. old as you, Dad. You know, yeah, so, there you, you go. Know, yeah, you, go. You, know, you know, you know, but. So I'm of a different generation, you know. Yeah. When when I went to buy records, it was all on vinyl. There was no CD. CDs didn't come until I was 25. Right. And by that time, I was in the business, and I just didn't think there was anything. You know, vinyl still has some sort of sexiness about it. Definitely, you know? yeah, and, yeah. And like, you know, but these direct to consumer packages. I mean, it's like you know, still buy the CDs. So if you want a CD, I love vinyl. I don't play vinyl. I I just stream it. But I love holding a vinyl. I love receiving a vinyl. Yeah. When I get something in the post, it's really cool. Yeah. And you know, but cool to but, look at. You know, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I would love one day, and when I, and I'm gonna do it one day. I'm gonna buy a, a stacked hi-fi like I used to have when I was, you know, in the 1983. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I had this pioneer stacked hi-fi, which I, I just wish I had now. But of course, like everything, it all went, you know, in the garbage, and uh, you know, so. And I know people that do play vinyl. They do play cassettes. They do play CDs on their stack. stack, And it's great. You know, I mean, yeah. that's, I, but for the general, let's face it, it's easier just to stream. Yeah. You know, if I, you know, if I want to hear a record now where well, I go onto YouTube and I put it in and invariably 99.9% .9 of the time it is on YouTube it's on and there, I can, yeah. and I can hear it. And I love to hold the vinyl, read the credits, read the sleeve notes, read look at the cover whilst streaming it yeah well that's cool and this you're still active in the listening of music where i think i've mentioned this before on the podcast that for me music has become just a background activity I've, I've never sat down unless i'm learning if i'm learning a song or something that's different but whenever i'm listening to music i'm either driving working cooking doing the washing up or something something boring like that and it's just a, it's like a background activity for me. I've never, not for years and years, have I sat down looking at a sleeve while listening to a, an album, which is a shame because I know that's, that's what I used to do. I used to read the lyrics. I used to read the credits and stuff like that. Um, it's just, I guess you get older, well, you, you this, prioritize other things. I don't, I can't listen to music in the office when I'm working. I've got to concentrate on yeah. what I'm doing. So if I'm learning a song, and it, or if it's a Sunday afternoon, I want to get some time away. I come into my drum room. I'll put some tracks on, on my iPod. Well, if it's actually my phone, all my songs are on my phone. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I sit with with my electronic kit, or you know, or I'll just sit um, with my pad kit or something, and I'll put the thing on low, and I'll just you know, noodle around. But I only listen to I listen to music in the car. But I but again, I plug my um, I. I I can stream through YouTube or one of the, I don't actually stream on Spotify. Okay. Even though I have a Spotify account, I use it purely for data. Mm -hmm. I don't stream on Spotify. It's just, it, I like will do at some point, but because I'm there, he's advocating streaming and I'm not streaming on Spotify. Yeah. But I, but I, I, I have YouTube to me is where I stream, you know, but it's the same sort of thing. It's one of the, it's one of the streaming, you know. Of course, yeah, yeah platforms yeah. um so um but i listen to youtube in the car i listen to podcasts you know there's a i'm into this um there's a guy called bart van der Zee, there's this thing called drum history podcast um 
which is all the sort of the goes back to the early all the classic drum companies the stick companies the cymbal companies of various things and he does that and of course i listen to the dane campbell <laughs> of course podcast. you know so i listen to that in the car um you know I'm, i know it sounds like an old man thing to do listen to a listen to a you know a uh a, a, a audio book but uh it's kind of you know it's that's what, what's what i do and also on like an airplane but the problem is you ever try to get internet on an airplane you know, I mean, well, never works. Um, no, no, that, that's is that that's exactly. They go, oh, we got internet, yeah, but does it work? You know, yeah. you know, uh, it's it's kind of uh, you know. <laughs> so that's so that's that's where I that's where the only time I listen to mu music is on, yeah. on those. So yeah, but when I was a kid, of course, it would be every every day. I'd be in my room putting the records on, literally listening to them, yeah, avidly. You know, and that's, that's where you get, you know. But that was, but I, I just think. I think it's a different thing now. I think video games is really the whole sort of concept of putting music to video games, you know, is, uh, I mean, yeah. there's kids, there's, there's kids that discover old music through video games. Totally. You know? And I'm, and I'm, I'm talking going back to the forties, fifties, sixties. And I think that's good. I think that's, a, but we've got to look at it a whole different, I can't go back, go, oh, well, back in the seventies when we used to do this, mm. it's the whole, that's, that's like saying, you know, that's like when I was, I remember in 1972, I remember I was talking to my grandmother or grandfather, one of my grandparents, and there was a, um, there was a car that I really liked, um, you know, uh, uh, that I saw some sort of sports, sports car, I go, this is what I want to get when I'm, when I'm big, bigger, you know, and my, and my grandmother said, um, I had a grandmother, grandfather, I can't remember which one it was, but there was, I remember they said, well, when, I remember when the Model T Ford came out, you know, which was 1908. And I'm like, what, I'm like, what the fuck do I care about the Model T Ford for? It's, you know, they, look at this cool thing. Look at this cool car that I'm just showing you. But of course the Model T Ford back then, it's like me going to a kid now and going, when I used to pick up a vinyl record, he's going to go, what the fuck do I care about the vinyl record for? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I just want to stream it, you know? So it's the whole, it's that generation gap. But, totally. You know, but, yeah, anyway. you, just got, you just got to go with it. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I guess it's just because, because you, you manage, I guess, bands that have a, a generally older demographic you've just got to deal with the fact that the fans of those bands are more likely to want the physical product which is a good thing i think i, I imagine if you're a and what is interesting is a especially in the uk there's a new wave of like classic rock bands coming out i guess lots of bands like my age maybe in the 20s but i've noticed they still they're still appealing to that older audience which i find really interesting but, and well, encouraging well, well, it, it's it, it's kind of funny because Greta Van Fleet. Let's use them as like yeah. an example. When they came out, you know, there's a lot of Joey Tempest loved Greta Van Fleet. My assistant Michelle loved Greta Van Fleet. I thought they were great. I didn't really kind of embrace them the same as they did, but you know, mm -hmm. but. And I think the old, the older generation liked them because they were young kids playing cool Zeppelin esque rock. Yes. Okay? But the kids that they were trying to appeal to, I mean, I remember Michelle's son called it Dad Rock. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely. This is, thing. you know, I'm not into Greta Van Fleet because my dad likes them and my and my mum likes them. You know, so. And, and, and I just think it's, you know, yeah, there's, listen, there's a whole, you know, I'm a rock fan. I'm a rock fan at heart. I love rock music. I, you know, um, how long it's going to last if in 50 years time, are we going to still, is that when our generation and I'm and, and including you, you yeah. know, uh, you know, um, so let's say when you're 80 years old, you know, and, and I'm dead and I'm well, well gone. Right are we still going to have you know it's like in the 30 in the in the 1890s the whole music it was a guy with a ban, banjo you know do, do we listen to that anymore no do we listen to do what before rock and roll in 1955 that 40s do what thing you know i mean there's obviously this little niche there's going to be niche rock fans that yeah. are coming up th through the years but would you be really would you personally and your brothers be 
as committed to rock and roll if it wasn't for your dad being in Motorhead? Yeah, possibly not. It's really hard yeah. to know. You know, you know. So, so I, so I think that it's that it's and when and you're into rock. So when like you have kids, you're going to be telling that onto them. So there's going to be this. But in general, my parents weren't into music. You know, my the the only album that they ever owned that I re- liked was the Carpenters, and I'm a huge Carpenters fan, right? Cool. And it, and it was the singles 1965 to 1975. Sorry, 1969 to 1975. It was the brown cover, and I remember the vinyl. In fact, it's still at my, it's still at the house in in England now. Oh, wow. And uh, but I couldn't admit to anybody that I liked the Carpenters when I was trying to be cool and you know hip at 15 <laughs> years old. But I but I did, and um, you know, but they weren't into music. So I, I had no older brothers and s- sisters that were. It was only when I was 14 that my peers at school, it was like, you know, I discovered rock and roll in a very, you know, and I'm not talking about T-Rex and Sweet and Slade back in the 70s. I was, you know, in the early 70s. I was, and I was into the sort of the new wave thing in the sort of the, the, the mid to late 70s. But in 79, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Led Zeppelin, Rush, Deep Purple. It was that, that was it, you know. Yeah, but, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> but, but, but how many kids now, unless you've got parents, how many kids that don't, that were like me, don't have parents that were musically inclined mm. or know what about, are, are discovering rock and roll? I, I think, you know, so, and plus, you know, it isn't like, even the, you know, you say that the older fans like physical. They like it because I like vinyl because it just reminds me of a, of a better time. Right, you know, yeah. but and it, let's face it, you know, I some of these drum kits I, I've got just just going back but back to this, this drum here, this Ludwig Colosseum. I wanted this drum so bad when I was eighteen years old. Never got one. Have one now. I actually went and got the Black Shadow. I was going to get it was between a Black Shadow and a Ludwig Chrome double bass kit, but I but the Ludwig. Um, the chroming on the Ludwig was really bad back then. Ludwig in the mid '80s started riveting their seams because oh, wow. the glue because the glue wood, and it looked horrible. Mm. So I went with the black shadow because it was classier. And you know, but I got this. So this is this to me. I mean, it's a great sounding drum. Sounds bloody amazing. But but it's um, I bought that because it takes me back to it. You know, now I can I can buy it. You know, yeah. and there's quite a lot of these. You know, an old Gretsch kit because I'm a chart because I love. Charlie Watts. So I've got a 1962 round bat, round badge Gretsch. Beautiful. White, you know, white, white marine pearl, body rich slinger lamb, all this Ludwig, the, the, the champagne sparkle. I've got a smoky 1978 Vista light because I saw that when I first started in a, in a music store north of Nottingham, it, you know, and I kind of, when that came up for sale, Chad Sexton, who's the drummer in 311, or three one one, however you pronounce it. Right. Um, um, that 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 was his his kit. I I bought that off, off of him, and uh, you know so and I bought that because I do I play it a lot. Not really. I mean you know it's a great sounding kit. I had it when I if I one day I want to get a bigger drum room. I want to get a huge room where I can set up all the kits. Have more set up. Yeah. Kit, you know, yeah. You know, that would be amazing. You know, yeah. But that that's not possible right now. I just don't have the space. But. I'm just saying that's why I got that. So we kind of, I, we buy vinyl, but as I say, most people that I know of my age that they, they actually stream, they actually do stream. They just want the vinyl because it just reminds them of an earlier time. But if you do a great direct to consumer package, I think CDs are going to stay for your generation. Yeah, that's true. I think you know, so. You know, you know, because the CDs to you are vinyl, but it's going to be a novelty item like vinyl. People say, oh, vinyl's coming back. No, it's not. We've done a thousand copies. Yeah, yeah. We've, done, know we've, you know, we've done a limited run of vinyls, you know, you know, and, and that, because that's all we're going to sell. If we could sell 20,000 vinyls, we would sell 20,000 vinyls. Yeah. But, we, but see, we can't. So, you know, and that's where... We, we have to, you know, so streaming is really, I say to, you know, people say, oh, the bands don't, don't get paid from streaming. We're not getting paid from physical right now because mm. the cost of distributing physical and pressing and now with the whole Brexit thing, you know, we just had Ricky Warwick, 500 vinyls uh, were caught up in customs in France. 
um, and didn't get and didn't get accounted to the first two week sales because um, the the they were pressed in England. The di distribution pl plant is in France, and then it gets shipped back to England. It got caught get customs going into France because mm. of all the Brexit stuff. Yeah. So so if it wasn't for Brexit, that's an easy transaction. Just you know a truck across the channel going back. Yeah. It's, 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 it's easy. But that's where you know so. Where do people, you know, but you can hear it. The minute Ricky's album was out on February the 19th, within, well, in fact, it was out prior. The, in fact, the night, the three hours before it was out, oh, they, right. actually put it, they actually put it on YouTube, you know. So you could listen to that record with your headphones on and you didn't have to buy it. Yeah. So, you know, um, and, and look, but of course YouTube's monetized. So the more you listen to it, the more we get it's fractions it's, of a penny. Yeah, it's tiny. You know, yeah. you know, but that's the way forward. I mean that, you know, mm. we're, we're like, we're like not going to stop. We're not going to stop people d doing that when, you know, I mean, you can't make people spend, you know, I mean, this whole thing with Lars Ulrich and Napster, you know, I was, I'd heard of Napster. I wasn't really familiar with it until Lars Ulrich gave me a, Give me a, a an advert for Napster. Yeah, I suppose. You yeah. know, you know, and go, you know, guys, you know, please don't use this. You can get music for free from Napster. I don't make any money from it. Please don't, you know. I mean, <laughs> kids, kids, what well, we get it for free? Wow, yeah. great, you know, because of course every music fan thinks rock stars are billionaires. Yeah, some obviously well, some some of them. Well, of course, well. Lars, well, of course, Lars is, but, yeah. you know, that's, but, you know, but like, you know, uh, you know, everybody, everybody thinks that, you know, your dad is probably a multi-billionaire. Yeah, probably, yeah. He's in Modag, you know, and uh, Biff, you know, they think Biff's rolling in all this money, you know, and, uh, you know, they're just working musicians. They yeah, just yeah. have to work, you yeah, know, yeah. and, you know, and so that's this, this misconception out there, isn't there? You know, but I just think that people need to, you know, listen just just enjoy music however you can if yeah. you if you if you're gonna stream it just stream it as many times as you can because the more times you stream it the more those fraction of a penny build up to a penny and then <laughs> then it can build up to a pound you know so. yeah i think I, I think um i guess people are not aware of how pathetically small it is so i think the more people that talk about it the better um and they realize because yeah, I think people re like I. Someone told me a few years ago. Oh yeah, I downloaded your album on Spotify. I was like, oh, cheers. But, um, that that doesn't mean you bought it. I think they people think it means I bought it. I pay for my Spotify. I've downloaded it onto my phone. And that means you yeah, get money, yeah. right? I'm like, no. You need yeah, to listen yeah. to it. You need to listen to it like a hundred times for that to count as a sale. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. It's something like that, isn't it? I think. No, actually, I have a lot more than that. But more, yeah. you know, but you know, but it's it's. Listen, I'm not a big advocate of streaming at all. If it was up to me, we'd be all buying physical products. Yeah. And everything will be back. We'd turn the clock back to 35 years. And <laughs> 40 years. But that's technology and that's the way it is. You know, we're yeah. in this digital age. You know, I stopped buying CDs about six, seven years ago, downloading on iTunes. But yeah. now iTunes are trying to get you to go onto Apple Music, which is a streaming service, you know. But again, like I say, I listen to a lot of my music on an aeroplane. And that's fine, having a streaming service. Get me freaking internet that works on an aeroplane yeah. so, I can, so I can stream. Yeah. Because that's why I want to buy the physical download, if you like. If that's, I don't know, it's a yeah, sort it's of an oxymoron, but, you know, the two words physical and download. But, you know, I'm paying for that. It's on my phone. Yeah, you know, and you know, and that's so that's kind of because I, you know, I've got CDs and I want to put them on my phone. I can't even burn them. I've got on my desk in my office. I've got my main laptop and I've got another laptop which is third generation because it's the only one with a CD player in it. And that's mm -hmm. how I play my because I still get sent CDs and that's how I play it. But trying to burn that now onto onto iTunes, they're coming up with all these ways to stop you doing it. So you have to buy a, buy a digital mm -hmm. download. So I just buy the download now. I used to go, well, I want the physical CD because in case anything happens to my hard drive, I've got the CD. 
Well, as, as I told you, I've got boxes full of CDs. To be honest with you, if all my hard drive crashed, well, I've got it on the cloud now anyway. Well, but good. if anything, but, but if anything crashed, I wouldn't have. The, I wouldn't know where the CDs are to f fish them out. You know what I mean? So why? So why not pay ten pound for a download as opposed to fifteen for a CD? When all I would do is rip the CD through, throw the CD in a box, and never see it again. You know, because because mm. it's not it's 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 not a collector you know a collector's thing for me. No, okay. I. As you can see, I'm a collector of stuff. Yeah, I I like collect various other different things, you know. But and I'm and I'm, I love collections, and I think I mean all of people's when people have a great collection, no matter what it is, it can be anything. Antiques, yeah. it can be guitars, it can be it can be you know shoes. I I just think collections are a great thing to me. I just love that whole concept. So, um, but there is, you know. C CDs to me just don't. There is people that do have racks and racks of c c CDs and they collect them. That's fine, but not for me. Vinyl, mm. though, every single piece of vinyl I own is in my games room upstairs on um, cube racks. I know. know. I've got some of those actually in my drum room. Yeah, I don't own yeah. many vinyls, but I most of the my vinyls I own are probably my own bands. <laughs> well, I well, 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 I bought a few. I, I see. I ended up selling a bunch of vinyls to buy one of my first symbols. Stupidest thing I've ever done. I bought a, I bought a Piesty symbol uh, back in 1981 and sold a whole bunch of my vinyls for oh. a pound a piece. Oh. And I sold a hundred of them to buy this hundred pound symbol. Of course, the symbol broke about two years later. Oh, went in no. the tr I don't know where that is now. Yeah. And all my all my vinyls are gone. You know, but uh, you know, but that, but you like do what what you do. I, I've still yeah. got a lot of my vinyls from but, but back in the day, and I have. But most of my vinyl collection is actually bands that I manage, and when they come out, because I, I, I do like to to, you know, I do like to physically yes. look at them. This, this is great. what we made. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. That's you know, yeah. That's yeah. the same with me, really. I I don't have an active vinyl player I can play them on anyway, so it's just mm. to look at. Mm. And then, but that's I did right, buy. Yeah. I did buy the new Weezer album. Do you know that band, Weezer? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, um, well, yeah. They're like one of my favorite bands. So, yeah, yeah. And the, yeah. the new album came out. Yeah, I streamed it, but I'm like, I love this. I'm going to buy it. So I bought the yeah, vinyl. Yeah. It's still in, well, the, still wrapped up in the cellophane, but I don't know. I just well, wanted is, to buy it. <laughs> no, but this is why I think direct to consumer packaging, where you come up with, and where I'm constantly trying to come up with new ideas yeah. of where the music is free. But we, we sell music to get people to buy concert tickets when yeah. we're back to normal. That's yes. the whole thing. That's the know? idea, yeah. You know, so, but also do merchant, do these sort of, you know, everybody likes cool stuff, you know. So, you know, like when they brought out the USB keys. Now, I don't even have a USB slot on my computer. So that's really, wow. To, 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 no, I've got the new, the new um, Thunder, Thunderbolt. No. two or whatever it is you know this is I the new know. apple stuff so i've not got even the us i have to have an adapter that plugs the usb in so do you remember when they used to come out with the the live usb key things yeah and they put it in a really cool box i thought that was cool i like wanted to i've got a whole bunch of those things you know and so there's different ways you can do direct to consumer packaging with cool stuff that people want you know um you know i mean i've got I, I, ideas i'm not going to share them here because we, we're still in the process with them i'm constantly trying to come up with different uh, different things that merchandise type cool items that we can mm. put muse music on you know i mean you know i i you know with the, you've got the earbuds now the apple earbuds you know the, which which obviously are bluetooth yeah you know you can do things where you know, you can have, you know, because to buy a physical CD, I think we should get into little other little things where you've got little a little Bluetooth square that's kind of fashioned in the in the shape of the band's logo that like sits in your car on a magnet, sits to something, and that will Bluetooth to your car stereo it will bluetooth to your computer that's it's cool. still a it, it, it you know it's just one of the i mean it's just ideas trying to come up with to to get away from and this is small units yeah little you know i mean what do, what do women like they like diamonds they like gold yeah and, you know i mean they but these are small little packages 
that you get, you know, this is what, I mean, let's face it, you know, we, we, we all like a little box with, with yeah, like, yeah. Um, something cool in it. The cost of, of shipping vinyl around, yes, the cost um, of shipping CDs, especially with the warehouses, I say, the you know, the vinyl got caught up with, with the whole customs thing. Mm. We've just got to come up with a way of, of reducing, I mean, and I'm not going to get all green on everybody, but the carbon footprint of trucks going up and down the motorways every every day. We've okay. got to, you know, so this is why kind of, you know, digital music, just getting music out there. We've got to sell. Bands have got to make money other ways. Con concert tickets is one. When we're back up to running, doing concerts, concerts is a great way of selling. Yeah. That, you know, of, and you record an album so people then want to go and see you live. That's what albums are for now. You don't make any money off records. You, even if you get nice advance, it all goes on pressing up the, you know, the album to, sorry, yeah. re, re, recording the album. You can do it yourself. Now, you don't need a label, but the cost of marketing, the cost of press, the cost of pressing, the cost of distribution, all that, you know, is, is, is more than people understand why why this stuff why is this stuff so so expensive well the artist gets a very as you know a very small percentage of what that money is yeah. because everybody has to all the other costs have to be covered you know but right. um so uh, yeah I, I just think we're constantly trying to come up with ways of giving the consumer a cool product whether it's a vinyl whether it's a cd or whether it's something that we haven't even in, invented yet you know no that's good that's good to hear and i think that's the, yeah, that is the way forward. It's it's merchandise items alongside with concert tickets. But like like you said, your uh, well, not all, but a lot of your acts are, I guess, slightly older. Like, are you are you worried about? Is it going to be a time where they're not going to want to tour or they sure, you know, physically sure, physically sure sure yeah? And I think that so that's sure. why you need all these other things to kind of make up for that time. Yeah, you know, I mean, I manage classic rock acts because that i wake you know life's too short to hate what you do yeah you know and so with me it's always been do what you want to do and the money will come cool don't don't just chase the money you know of course we all need money to live i need money to buy more drums more drums see. yeah <laughs> uh, but you know you need you know you've, you've got to be sensible but to me i get up every morning I love, I love listening. I love my acts. Yeah. I love all of them. You know, I love, uh, they're, they're not only clients, they're friends, they're great people. I get a buzz off seeing them live. When they do put out new music, I get a buzz from that. Mm. There's nothing better to me than hearing a band that come out with great new music, you know, whether, and that's why this new wave of classic rock, there's some great stuff out there. It is, you yeah. Know, those damn crows what a great band amazing stone yeah. stone broken um you know all these sort of um you know your massive wagons all this sort of stuff that's that's coming up you know yeah. have you heard um, mason hill yet of They're, course yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. they just yeah, released they, an album yeah, yeah that's right yeah it's full yeah. of tunes <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, no but you know so th this is to me it's about you know guitar bass and drums yeah that's what it is so you know you know i mean you know, I'm I'm not a big fan of electronic music. You know, um, and it's it's got to be organic for me, no matter what it is. That's why I like. You know, I'm really into jazz. I love going to Ronnie Scott's when I'm in London. Don't go half as much as I want. Yeah. But to go and see, I mean, that's funny because I was thinking about it last March actually when they started saying that we can't do concerts because we need to be social di distance. Well, if you ever been to Ronnie Scott's on a Tuesday night, There's, they they've been um, social distance for years. You're like in, in your own the whole in the whole building. You know what I mean? And they like bring you your food and you don't move. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of funny because you know jazz music is the is the original social distance music. Yeah, music. I suppose. I suppose. You know, yeah. You know, but but I mean that's on a Tuesday when you've gone on a Friday or Saturday to Ronnie Scott and they've got some name names there. You, 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 they're queuing down the street, but. You know, you know, again, it's just appreciating the instrument, like anything, like any, you know, anybody that's got talent, um, whether they're a manager, whether they're a producer, whether they're a songwriter, whether they're a guitar player, a drummer, a singer, you know, anybody that, that to me, that's, that's talented, an artist, somebody that can paint, I, I'm in all of those people. I'm in all of those people. 
good you know no, no and, i think uh, that's important yeah. Yeah. So, yeah um yeah so we come towards the end now we wind down um i've got uh, i don't know you probably heard of patreon right you know of course, yeah. i've got a yeah. patreon page and um w- one of the things one of the benefits to my top tier patrons is that i get they get to ask a question so i've got a question for you okay um, from yari who's in finland okay um he is a big motorhead fan. He's a motorhead banger, I believe. But he was wondering if you had like a favorite motorhead moment or memory from your days on the road. Or <laughs> I'm sure there's lots to choose from. Or there is lots to choose from. Um... I'm just trying to think of anything that I can that I can repeat. <laughs> oh yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I know, I know. Uh, That's um... the problem. That's the problem. Well, I mean, <laughs> I. W- I had some some really good times with those guys. You know, Lemmy Lemmy was. Um, I stopped working with them in two thousand and ten. In two thousand and fourteen, the last time I saw Motorhead was when they were at Hyde Park with Black Sabbath. Oh yeah, and um, and Lem, uh, Lemmy invited. I was saying goodbye to everybody on the bus at the end of the gig. You know watch sabbath and we we're hanging out and i went back on the bus and let me call me down and he sat and we and we talked for about 45 50 minutes never like we talked before wow. i'd never talked to them because i'd always been working with them it's you know you know lemmy was very genuine he was a pain in the ass a lot of the times he really was but he was a very genuine guy and there was no bullshit with him and that's what i love i love guys like that i love guys where it's straight down the line you know and that's where I try and be, you know, no, no bullshit. Tell it like it is. Yeah. And um, we sat down with Lemmy and, and I've never had a conversation. It was a very in depth because he wasn't very well at the time, you know, and we were talking about his, how he was and, you know, and uh, um, uh, the, the last time I saw him was actually at the Classic Rock Awards in 2010. Um, we had Europe playing and we were on a table next to the Motorhead table. And let me call me over and I went and spoke to him for about two, two minutes. That was the last time. That was about five weeks before he passed, you know. Um, but no, I've got a lot. I mean, I've got, oh my God. Uh, let me think of a Lemmy story. Okay. Lemmy, when I would be the one that would call him to do interviews on the road. Right. And, and Lemmy was very much like he had to make the decision for everything. You know, um, in fact, I'm just going to preempt this, 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 this story I'm going to tell you with, with another one. When they put the Inferno album out, um, every time Modeb put an album out, there was always a big, a big thing about trying to come up with the title for the record, right? Well, they, we had the cover from Joe Patagno. It was the three war pigs, one facing you, two to the side, in flames, right? And, we're, and they, so we had the cover. We just didn't have a title for the album. And Mickey would call me. If you've got a title and, you know, and blow it. And I'd come up with these things. And Lemmy would go, ah, shit. That's shit. <laughs> no matter, because, because if, you know, you'd come up with an idea for Lemmy. Oh, that's shit. But if you just move that to there, there you go. It's perfect now. Like if you had a piece of artwork, right, you okay. know, and you come up with an artwork. I, I fucking hate that. But hold a minute. And he'd draw a little line about that big on it. There you go. Now it's fine. Because it, <laughs> because it would have Lemmy's touch to it, you see. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And, um, I mean, your dad will tell you this. You know, this is... This is... So, so um, the, we... Um, uh, there was this... The Inferno album, Mickey Court. I just got that artwork in. I'd just seen the artwork. And at the same day, your dad had a company called Minerick making these guitars. And they had this guitar that was called the Inferno. Because it had the, yeah. it had the flame cut out on the back, and I looked at the cover and I remember seeing this note about the guitar, and I went, "Why don't we call it Inferno?" So Mickey, Mickey's on the phone and says, you know, "Lemmy, Adam thinks we should call it Inferno." Oh, that shit! Tell him to fuck off. <laughs> so the next day, this is a god honest, true story. The next day, Mickey. Adam, we've got a title for the album. It's going to, Lemmy's come up with it, Inferno. What? So I was like, bravo, Lem. That, that's, that, that, that's great. So Lemmy had, everything had to go by Lem. You know, it was Lemmy's, it was Lemmy's 
baby, wasn't it? Mo yeah. head. Let's let's let, let's face it. And we've got to respect that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, you know, uh, there was one time we were doing a festival in Holland in the early two thousands called Arrow Rock. And UFO were on the bill and a whole bunch of others. It was it was a kind of a classic rock. It was Holland's classic rock festival. Motorhead were on it. And Uta, the PR girl, called me a few days before and said, we've got this interview with uh, this TV station called Naked TV, where two naked girls are going to interview Lemmy. Now I knew with Lemmy, Norm, and but they but they want an answer within an hour. So I called Lemmy up. It was ten o'clock in the morning, LA time. I called Lemmy up, and now with Lemmy, the however he answered the phone, you knew how to deal with him that that day. Okay. If he went hi Adam, then you knew he was okay. If he go what? If you pick up the phone and go what? You know, okay, don't ask him anything. You need you need, a, you need an answer on because because wait till the next day. Yeah, I, I get you, what you mean. You know, otherwise you, you're going to get n nowhere with it. So bless him. I calls him up and he goes, "What?" I go, "Oh fucking hell, here we go." Lemmy, Arrow Rock on Saturday. This is on like the Tuesday or Wednesday. Arrow Rock on the Saturday. They want to do uh, um, naked TV. Two two women are going <laughs> to going to interview you naked. Well, that sounds like a bad idea. I don't want to do that. I said, okay, fine, no, no problem. So I hung up the phone with him, called Uta. I said, let me get Mickey D to do it. So I called Mickey and Mickey said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do it. But by this time, we were flying out the next day to do, because Arrow Rock was one of the first shows. And um, we, uh, so I called Mickey. Mickey said, yeah, sure, I'll, I will do it. Well, anyway, we're in the dressing room backstage at Arrow Rock. I remember Pete Way was there, right? Now, Pete was in the mode, because we had two dressing rooms. One, one kind of for Lemmy and kind of Mickey and Phil had this, had this com communal room. And uh, Lemmy, in, in, in Mickey's room was the, uh, sorry, in L Lemmy's room was all the uh, catering, all the drinks. And they had a bottle of vodka there, which Mickey always had, because Mickey would sell it to the crew, you see. Sell Mickey wouldn't it. drink vodka. Phil would have his cider and, you know, and Lemmy would have his Jack and, Phil and have his liquor, you know, but there was a bottle of box. Anyway, Pete Way was there. I remember this like yesterday. Pete Way was there trying to snag this bottle of vodka because he's, he's, he was supposed to be clean, you see, and his TM wouldn't allow him anything. His band, so he was in our dressing room trying to get this vodka. And Lemmy was trying to, you know, yeah, sure, you can like take the vodka. So, well, I mean, that's Mickey's vodka. How much are you going to pay for it, Pete? You know, and all this. Anyway, we, we, we were laughing. Lemmy's in a, Lemmy's in a good mood. We then walked, with, we're, we're talking, we walked past Lemmy's dressing room, from Lemmy's dressing room, past Mickey's dressing room, and Mickey's on this big chair with his, with his, with his knees apart, like, like this, and he's, got, and he's got his arm around two naked chicks. <laughs> now, now, I'm saying this, I hope Mia's not watching this. It's part, of the, this is a, it's part of the job. Part of the job, ex exactly. There was a, a blonde white chick on one knee and a black chick on the other on the other knee. And if you know Lemmy, you know he likes black women. Yeah. So Lemmy's walking around. He looks in and sees Mickey there, double takes, and he goes, "Oh, this is for me." I went, "Ah, no, Lemmy, no, you. This is for Mickey. You, you, get away." So. We, they ended up doing this in interview. This is no word of a lie. And, and I wish I had a cell phone with a camera on it to take the picture because it would have been a classic where you got this black chick on one knee, this white chick on the other knee, Mickey there, and Lemmy's kind of come in, sitting on Mickey's crotch <laughs> on, the, on the black chick's knee on top of Mickey's knee. So Mickey's kind of like, 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 like this, trying to, get, trying to do this in, in interview with it's Mickey and Lemmy <laughs> together. <laughs> And then the two chicks either side. What the hell? <laughs> and and it's it's it was just Uta was there. Uta was cracking up because you know and uh, yeah. So that 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 was that was a Lemmy. That was a kind of a oh you know a God. fun you know a, a a a fun moment. So Lemmy ended up doing the interview with Mickey. Both of them sitting because Mickey was in the chair. Lemmy was kind of like easing his way in to to like sit on this black chick's knee. But she was, of course, sitting on Mickey's knee. Yeah. So you, so you can imagine the, 
the uh, picture, you know, mm. of it, you know. And I've been trying to see if there's any of this on YouTube because it was naked TV. It was film. Yeah, it was, someone's um, obviously you know, filmed you know, it. Yeah. You know, well, they filmed it, but I, I can't find it. I've been doing search on it. So if anybody knows, can actually find that interview and can actually, you know, then like send me the link because I'd like to see it again. It was, that would be hilarious. Yeah, it was funny. But yeah, oh, there's, oh, there's just so many, so many of them. I've got, I've got, I could write a book, but I'm, but I'm not going to. No, no, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. That one was all we want. I'm sure yeah. Yari will appreciate that one. I've not heard it before. I doubt many people have heard that before. <laughs> That's cool, man. Yeah. I'm um, actually not sure. I'm actually not sure where your dad was. And he could have been in the dressing room, but, uh, you know, yeah, I know it was just Mickey and Lemmy, but, you know. I, anyway, I, well, I remember, fairly embarrassing, I suppose, but I did see a video that I think Mickey D posted a few months ago of like some gig and some fan was filming i don't know if it was a fan or someone who worked for the band was filming something backstage of mickey and lemmy walk into a stage at a festival and it was just kind of over the shoulder kind of just watching what they were talking about and and then they get to the stage and then behind lemmy and mickey i think is you and i can't remember which other kind of crew member carrying my dad <laughs> Oh the, yes, 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 yes. See this? Well, yeah. Well, that was. I think that wasn't that the time when he was Lord Axme, and I don't uh, know. and and he and he insisted on being carried to the stage. Oh right. It was, uh, it was it was it was something like like that. Mickey, I thought uh, he was think, he was drunk. I thought oh well, because he was too well, drunk. Well, 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 oh. he was probably he was probably, but that's <laughs> a whole different thing. Uh, no, no, no. I I seem to remember he was like. You know, I, I need to be carried to the stage because I'm Lord. Ah, Jackson. right. So that's, so, uh, that's that's interesting to hear your perspective uh, on that. I just yeah, thought yeah. he was too drunk to walk or something like that. Which is... no, you, <laughs> you, you, your dad used to drink a lot, but he was always he was always. Uh... No, he could always walk. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, <laughs> he that's could, good. You know, he could, you know, he, you know, he could always yeah, play, he, which was important. So I think that's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's but, the yeah. problem. That's the problem with them. Um, once you discover you can still play while you're drunk, I think that's a problem area. And I know you're... I can't play while I drink, so I don't drink. Oh, oh well, 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 yeah, that's that's me. I can't, you know, that's why I don't really drink a lot because yeah. I've always been, I'm always trying to be in control of everything. I'm always the guy that's got to organize everything. So, mm. you know, but yeah, always, you know, I mean, I mean, I like a glass of wine now. I drink more now than I ever have done. I like wine. I like, you know, I like fireball whiskey is my oh, right. okay. voice, you know. And I can drink that till I'm, you know, and I, I've got jugs of it in the freezer. So every every weekend I have a glass of that with ice, and it's great, you know. Okay. But uh, um, there's another story, you know, you know the story about because your dad was a constant joker all the time, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, know, you heard the story about the horse in uh, in um, uh, just outside San Francisco at the Shoreline Amphitheatre when we we're doing the Metal Masters tour with Judas Priest, uh, Heaven and Hell. Which is of course Black Sabbath with yeah. Ronnie, yeah, uh, Motorhead and Testament. Testament. You know, he, I've heard the story and yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, well, so. well, well, he, he was a well. The, there's another thing because he had the horse, but that was during um, Testament set. Yes, he comes on stage on the horse, all dressed in what was he dressed in? Dressed as a woman or something? And he was dressed uh, as a woman, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lemmy was dressed as a sheik with the, yeah. with the, and then Mickey was. What was Me Mickey dressed? A Me Mexican with a with a brush, yeah, 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 <laughs> like, yeah. A, like a sweet name brush. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, and uh, well, when then of course Motorhead won. Well, when Heaven and Hell came on, your dad went and bought, got the runner to go and buy a hundred newspapers, and we handed them out to the first two rows right in front of Ronnie James Dio. Yeah. <laughs> so and with and with bribe of of gu gu guitar picks, if they if they read the paper when Black Sabbath came out and Ronnie came out, Phil thought it would be hilarious, but it was hilarious to yeah. see the first see a hundred people in the first two rows reading a newspaper, <laughs> <laughs> right? And I will never forget. So of course they all come out. We give them guitar picks. If you just 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 for at least. 15, 20 seconds after Ronnie comes out, just read read the newspaper and then put the, put it down. Well, there was one guy who was literally dead center front row 
that just continued reading the newspaper. For the whole game. Yeah, he was like, you know, I mean, for at least five or ten minutes, he was just quite happy to, oh, yeah, this is, oh, yeah, this is the, the sports section, you know, and he's, and, he's, and he's reading the paper. That was hilarious, you know, and like, I know, I remember when Ronnie came off, he went, which motherfucker did that? And of course it was, you know, Campbell's, of course. Yeah. Himself, you know, sorry, Phil, you know. <laughs> dad. But yeah, that was, oh, there was, there was so many great, great stories. You know, I've got, I, in fact, I'll, 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 I could tell you a load when we... Yeah, well, you bit, could do a whole podcast a on him, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 bless him. I mean, I've known Phil since 1981, you know, um, when I first saw Persian Risk, and I actually booked some gigs for them in my local area. Yeah, yeah. You know, when your dad was in the band Persian Risk, you know, so... I don't, I don't think you were born then, were you? I wasn't, no, I, I was oh, born no. in 80, 86. Okay. Well, Todd was born in 82. 82, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this would have been just before Todd was born, yeah, so. Cool. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, you know, I, um, uh, they were great times, you know. Persian Wrist were a great, great band. I'll look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still really good friends with Carl. Oh, good, yeah. I saw some Sentence, footage, footage like, of him the other day with playing with Bob somewhere. Yeah, 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 with Bob at the at the Cozy, Cozy. Power Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Carl, Carl's a brilliant singer and he's and he's he's a he's a great, great guy. So yeah. yeah cool. But no, you know, they, they were, you know, Persian Wrist were a really good band back then. They were one of my favorites, you know. And then uh, of course, you know, your dad, you know, got the motorhead gig and the gig at Hammersmith ever was in 84, May 84. I think it was May the seventh. If my memory serves me right, which was the first time that's, that Motorhead played Hammersmith with your that's, dad. That's my dad's birthday as well. Well, of course it's May the seventh. Of course, your dad's birthday. Well, yeah. maybe it was May. It was early May anyway. Okay, yeah. maybe it might, you know, it might well have been. Yeah. yeah, yeah, could have been actually. But uh, anyway, yeah. it was uh, Motorhead, nineteen eighty-four. I will Google it and see uh, yeah, when yeah. they played Hammersmith. But it was that, around that day. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Right. I'm glad it's good that you've got fond memories of that at the time and. Um, it's just interesting to hear the stories from like a, a different perspective than my dad's and, and, <laughs> and, and, from, and from what you read on groups and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm actually amazed your dad can, can remember any of it, but, uh, yeah. know, but uh, you know, he's a, uh, he probably can. No, I mean, just, just, yeah, listen, you know, Motorhead were legends, legends. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, really, you know, and Phil was there, let's face it, Phil was there one year, you know what I mean? So, you know, more than, uh, I think what was the story that he told? He said uh, he, I think on his like twenty fifth anniversary of being with the band or something, somebody asked him, uh, asked your dad. He said, "Was was your wife uh, su su surprised? Was your wife shocked when you joined Motorhead?" And he said, "No, but she's but she's shocked that I've been here twenty five years." Yeah, <laughs> you know, one of those things. Yeah, that's but, funny. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, there you no, go. that's cool. Yeah, well, um. We got, I got a quick, quick fire round for you, which is the thing okay. I've started the last few episodes. So just answer as quickly as you can, just so the audience can get to know you a little bit more. Um, okay. What's your favorite hot or cold weather? What's my favorite hot, what's my favorite weather? Hot, hot yeah, cold? Yeah, sorry, yeah, hot or oh, cold. Sorry. Yeah. Hot. Yeah, hence why you live in LA. LA. Yeah. <laughs> Day or nighttime? Um, daytime, actually, I think. Yeah, cool. Sweet or savory? Um, sweet. Guitar or bass? Uh, guitar. Nylon or wooden tip drumsticks? Uh, wood tip. Yeah. Bonham or Piet? Bonham. But but this is it's like sweet and savory. I've got it's both. both. And yeah. Bonham, you know, but 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 yeah, Bonham. Bonham. Yeah, from like a personal influence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Beatles or Stones? Um, Beatles, but again, I love both. Cool. Uh, this is a—I don't know why I asked this one. Dark or milk chocolate? <laughs> I need to change this dark. one. Dark. <laughs> I know. Is this the question? Dark. No, no, no. It's not uh, dark chocolate. Red or white wine? Um, red, but I like both. Okay. Favorite time signature to play? <sighs> Me four four. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most people say that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that, that's it, really. I don't know. It's just something I added in a few episodes ago. Um, cool. Yeah. I don't know. I might change them up a bit. I might get rid of the chocolate mm -hmm. question. But uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then the, the last thing that you're probably familiar with is if if you could start your, your dream band, you could create your own dream band with yourself on drums with any musicians that have ever lived or still live now, who would you choose to play the other instruments? 
Oh my goodness me. I honestly, I honestly don't know. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. Two of my favorite people that play that Ricky Warwick and Robbie Crane. Right. Okay. Who were in yeah. Black Star Riders. And I, and when I'm, when I in rehearsal with them or when we did the video shoot or when we, you know, it's an absolute, because they're both legends in my book. Ricky, Ricky is just, and Ricky, they're both great friends, but really, that is really something that just, you know, I go, if you, if you said, you know, I mean, okay, I could say, you know, listen, you know, Jimmy Page on, on guitar and, you know, and uh, uh, David Coverdale on vocals, I could say all that, you know, but, but um, it's, I really don't have, I mean, I'm a big fan of Rose Tattoo. Oh yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'd love to be on stage playing drums with Angry Anderson singing. That'd be brilliant. You yeah. know, you know, you know, and just that sort of like, you know, that sort of, I, I don't, I thought it's going to sound very boring. I actually don't really have, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, Lemmy, of course, an absolute legend on bass and vocals. So probably Lemmy on, Lemmy on bass and vocals, you know, and uh, I, maybe, maybe your dad on guitar, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, no, no, but no, no, but you know, I mean, you know, I mean, your dad's such an underrated gu gu guitar player. He, he really is. And, you know, and I've always known that from when I first saw him back in the Persian race, but, I don't know who who is yours. I well, yeah, I actually thought about this after someone asked me on a on a video call because I keep asking people this question. I never thought about it, but myself. But yeah, I did come up with a list. And who was it? It was again probably a bit more modern bands, I suppose, more to do with who influenced me a lot more. Um, but yeah, Cass Lewis on bass from Skunk and Nancy. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing bass player, but like he knows how to rock. He's kind of like a funky, he's capable of all the funk jazz stuff, but then he plays in a rock band. So he kind of blends the two worlds together really well. And I think he's just got a nice, tasteful bass player. Um, who else did I have? Um, guitar was more, well, I still don't know how to pronounce his name, which I need to check this. Um, the ba it's basically the guitar player from Incubus, who I think is a really, yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. it's really interesting. I think he was always interesting with the sounds, effects, and chords. Like every, you, you hear you hear one of his songs, and it's just different than everyone else. He's got his own kind of sound yeah, and yeah, voice, yeah, the songwriting. Yeah. No, he's not a lead player. Um, I guess if it, if I was to choose a like a lead guitarist again, it, it depends on the style. But like I love, and you you probably love him as well, John Mayer. Oh yes, like, yeah, like, absolutely, yeah, it's yeah. absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, obviously, you mentioned the Steve Jordan thing. I imagine I've listened the Steve Jordan stuff. I've heard is through the John Mayer stuff. That's what, yeah, 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 that's what yeah, I've been yeah. exposed to. I yeah, 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 yeah. I think I've seen him live once as well, which was cool. But yeah. Um, I don't think those musicians would particularly work in in the same band. But, well, um, it's, it's it's a bit like you know, like you know, I'm thinking of this now. The more I, you know, Joey Tempest is one of my favourite singers. You know, the singer in Europe, and you know, and um, but it kind of wouldn't work with hmm. having Lemmy on bass. You know, so yeah. so so to, to me, you know, the Ricky Warwick, Robbie Crane sort of thing especially as I have been playing with them. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, and, and I really can't think of anybody else that I would kind of, you know, because Ricky's just such a, such a, a talent in the, in the, in the songwriting. And, you know, he's a great rhythm gu guitar player and, you know, but I kind of like that. I'm more of a sort of, I'm more of a punk, you know, I, I grew up really, not i mean i can't play neil pert to save my life you know what i mean you know i mean you know i mean i'm tr i'm trying to and much as i think neil is a phenomenal drummer and really from people that know him i never met him but what a great human being as, as well and yeah. you know and and such a sad with his with his uh, daughter dying and his wife dying and then you know and him having cancer you know it's it, just a really sad uh, state of affairs for him but Neil was, and of course, I, I was really into Rush when I first got into music. You know, the first, the, like 2112, 
Fairwater Kings, Hemispheres, Permanent Waves, those four records to this day, put me on a desert island for the rest of my life with those four albums, I'll be as happy as Larry, right? Amazing. And Perch drumming is just beyond. But I like, you know, I really kind of, I prefer that sort of groove that, you know, Jordan is one that just literally, it's only just recently, last month or so, I've really kind of oh. started watching, watching Steve. I mean, I've not been aware of Steve Jordan for years, but him and Dennis Chambers are two that I'm really, because it's about, it's about just playing a beat and just grooving it and just doing that ostinato on the bass drum or an ostinato on the, on the hi-hat and the snare and just alternating the, the kick. Or doing an ostinato on the bass drum, boom, 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 and then alternating your your, your top half. Oh, and yeah, those yeah. and like those those guys just have this sort of just this groove, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, Clyde Stumberfield and you know, and um, um, Zigaboo, you know, from the Meters. Listen to that stuff, that old stuff that they were d d doing. Oh my God, it's just you know. It just blows my mind. And that to me is more stuff that I know because it's accessible. Joe, Mer I'm a great friend of Carmine Peace. He's a really good oh, really? friend of mine. And, Ask him and, if you'll uh, come on, sure. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. That'd be yeah, amazing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, absolutely. In fact, I'll send him a text after this. Thank you. Um, and, um, and also Vinny Appersey. Have you had Vinny on? No, and I'm not either yeah, of them yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> Well, Vinny and, and Carmine are, are, are good friends. And ah, cool. Carmine, Carmine once said to me, he did a clinic with Joe Morella because Thomas Lang's a really good friend of mine as well, um, even though I don't see him that much. But when we do, we, you know, we, we hang out. He's and Tom, insane. Thomas is, a, is a, he's one of the nicest guys you will ever meet. He really is. You look at all his videos, he come, he's, he's just that way. I met him in Australia in a hotel breakfast bar. What? In, in 2005, yeah. He was literally out there. I didn't even know. I was out there with Queensryche at the time. Um, and um, I, would, I was literally in a hotel. He was doing a, he was doing a, um, a, a Vic, Vic for drum clinic tour or something down there. And he was literally, I went, Thomas Lang, you know, and he went, yeah, hi, you know, and I'd start, you know, and, and we became great friends ever since. Wow. Know. And, uh, you know, but he's, he's one of these guys that, I went to one of his drum camps once because I was doing one with Jimmy DeGrasso. De I went to see how it all ran. Oh, he said, wow. come on, Adam, you know, sit, 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 sit in. And to me, you know, I need, I need, especially the older I am, when you show me something, I, I need to really dissect it and learn it, you know. He's like, right, then we're going to start with a single stroke on the, on the pad. Then we're going to start with a double stroke. And now I want you to split, split your mind into four, and this, this part of your brain does this leg, and this, you know, we're going to do a 17-8 on this leg, and we're going to do a, you know, we're going to do a, a sort of a, you know, a 5-4 a shuffle with this hand. And, and, and you know, and, it's, and it just, one thing that Carmine said to me, he did a clinic with Joe, Joe Morello once, and Joe said, you've got to have people leave this clinic inspired, not wanting to go buy a gun and shoot themselves. I think that's... You know, you Very know, because true. you know, and I've seen Virgil Donati and and Marco Miniman and all these guys, incredible players. I mean, they they blow my mind. And and Thomas can groove. Thomas Langer, oh, he's just a, he's just a mathematician. No, I've seen Thomas. He can groove. Thomas can do anything on the yeah. drums. Anything. Hundred percent. You know, you know, and but to me, I'm a Charlie. I like I like Charlie Watts. I mean, I like the you know what I like about Charlie Watts. He's used, he bought a drum kit in 1972 from SIR, which was a 1956, 1957 Gretsch, whatever it was. And he still uses that kit. What? He doesn't, end, he doesn't endorse anybody. Doesn't he can not. endorse, he, he has a, he, 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 I think he had a DW snare, but he, but he uses the same kit. I mean, that kit's been through the, putting new hardware on it and everything, but the shells, of it. And it was a kit he got, I think it was in 1972, he got a kit from SIR, and it was this 1956-57 Gretsch, and he fell in love with it, and he, and he bought it, and that's the kit, he's the natural wood kit he uses on the stage with the Rolling Stones, and you know, wow. 20, 20, 22, 12, 16, and 
that you know what i just i i love i've got a lot of drums you know what i i i really like guys that have one setup that they just love yeah you know that's their ultimate thing of course we've all got a, we all like a few you know a few snares most people have at least two or three if not for anything other than if you, they're on stage and one breaks they like need yeah. a spare yeah you know? yeah you know but you know i just to me it's the it's it's like I, these guys I know with huge gu guitar collections, and I'm I've got twelve guitars up, upstairs <laughs> for your you know, five I mean, five chords. Yeah, 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 <laughs> <laughs> five chords. I mean, because I like wanted a Les Paul. Yeah, I wanted a Les Paul in, in like in like my my house, and I wanted and then John Norham, who's arguably one of my favorite guitar players ever, besides Gary Moore. I think Gary Moore, Gary Moore would, would be the guitar player in my in, in my, my, my band. Awesome. There you go. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, but so John John Norham had this Japanese strat. Um, it's a cream strat with a rosewood f f fingerboard. Now I I like the maple f f fingerboards, and I was in Japan with them about four year, four or five years ago. This one there. Uh, there you go. Yeah, M yeah. Ma maple. That's just yeah, a yeah. Mexican one, but it's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, so I, I, I bought this um, Japanese strap that I had a, it actually had a maple fret, fret, fret sorry, maple fingerboard because the neck was maple anyway, but, the, but the, you know, and uh, anyway, I bought it because I, I like, you know, so that, that was the two. Then I got a couple of other, I've got like four or five strats. I've got this Les Paul. I've got some, some acoustics and a few other things, but you know, I I love I love guitar collections. I love. I mean, look, well, look, look what you got. I mean, you know, are these uh, are actually these yours? Are these the, your? Yeah, these are actually. Well, to be honest, the the, the acoustic my old man gave to me because mm. at the time I owned my own acoustic. That I used to work in a guitar shop. I don't know if you know this. I used to work in a guitar shop, and we used to sell a brand called Hudson. Yeah, and um, it was kind of like the shop's own brand but it wasn't but it was basically and i had a nice kind of top of the range hudson i didn't really play it much it had like a v profile neck which i never really liked and um you know at the time i was like trying to sell a bit of gear and um i discovered that my dad had this in in stored in my brother's studio and he had two of them and i said well if you've got two of these can't i just have have one of them and sell my Hudson because I, I only need one acoustic guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is great because it's got a cutaway on it and you can plug it in. Not that I ever pick it up, but um, it's there if I ever want to. Sometimes me and my wife have a little strum mm. and a sing along. Well, no? I, I yeah. love... So so you can play guitar? Uh, well, not, not as good as my brother's, but mm. I know my way around. I'm more of a bassist, to be honest. So yeah, mm. I, bought, mm. I bought this bass. It's a Squire. But yeah. I, I used to play a lot when I was a teenager. And I did it in uni. I did a I did a pop music course, but I did it on bass, not on drums, which I think is interesting. But yeah, I used to be quite good on the old bass. And then I kind of um I only ever gigged in bands and I never played bass. I sold my I had an American Fender Jazz at the time. I sold that to Todd, who was playing bass in my band. Because I thought, well, at least he's using it. And then that band he moved onto the guitar sold the bass so i'm like i don't even know who, who's got the bass now but then last year i thought i'm gonna buy myself a bass and i've got you know we, we recently moved into this house like a year or so ago and i thought i'm set up my own little room um it's a mixture of it's a games podcast music workout room it's nice it's, yeah get of yeah. everything but i try and fit it all in um but yeah that's my bass and then my that's that's the electric guitar the strat is what i bought when i worked in that guitar shop I don't play it much, but yeah, John Mayer was an inspiration for me to buy a Strat. It was because of him, really, and I got it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, if I was a guitar player, I would, I would play a Strat. I mean, I just love the, you know, I love the. I mean, the Les Paul, because I'm not a guitar player anyway, and I know there's some great Les Paul players out. The Les yeah. Paul's a bit too heavy for me. Well, they are, yeah, yeah. You know, even though it's this is actually a chambered body, just the Strat is. The way the strats designed and there's the, the you know i would i just i just love strats so my i've got a i've got a japanese i've got an american i've got a mexican strat nice. and i've got a cup i've got a couple of squires and i've got a couple of fender acoustics which are cheap and you know because fen because fender don't don't make great acoustic guitars they're all cheap but but they're, they're okay if, if somebody comes around and wants to just yeah noodle on the acoustic guitar but if i had a um joey tempest has a Gibson J45, which is 
the nicest sounding acoustic guitar I've ever heard in my life. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, it really is, you know. Um, so I always said one day, if I ever had some money to burn, I, if I'm not buying drums anymore, I'd buy a J45. You know? Fair enough, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I love, to be honest with you, I could actually quite easily now, I've, my, the time I've got to invest in music, I, I, I'm relearning the drums. Yeah. You know, and, I, and, I, and, it's, and drums is my thing. I'm never going to be, I'm a, I'm a proficient drummer. I'm semi-decent at it, you know, I, you know, and, and I, and I'm getting better, cool. um, you know, which I think, you know, we, as you know, we, we, we all can learn them when Neil Perp, you know, what a few years ago had lessons from Freddie Gruber, you know, and Peter Erskine, you know, I oh, mean, really? that, oh yeah, yeah. You know, that was like, and Steve Smith to this day still has lessons from other people and, right. you know, and, uh, you know, and Greg Bissonette, if somebody's in town from out of, you know, from out of state you know, or from out of the country or some Cuban drummer, he'll have a lesson from him, you know, Amazing. which I think is awesome because these yeah. guys are just, you know, are just, uh, you know, but I, I mean, to, to me, yeah, I, I would I would love to learn to play the guitar, but I don't really have the time and just to be able to play a few I used to be able to play House of the Rising Sun with my five five chords. I think three of them I could use. There you go. You know, but, but 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 again, not good enough to play in a pub or anything. You know, so yeah. but you know, I mean, it's listen. It's like anybody. I think you know, if you want to learn to play an instrument, absolutely, I would say with the internet now, you can you can learn anything. Just spend some time and just really devote yourself and just learn. If you want to play rock music, absolutely, look at the brush players. Look at the because it's all about the musicality of it. Even if you're a great rock player, Bonham was very musical. Yes. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, I, you know, we're, we're doing the, you know, just the Bonham triplets, the, you know, the grooves that he did, you know, it's very musical, very musical, you know, and, uh, you know, there's, 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 there's a lot of guys that I'm discovering rock guys, Ian Pace. I mean, I love Ian Pace. You know, he, I mean, him and Cozy were, I think Cozy was ultimately my guy, but Ian Pace now is probably, you know, is, is an equal, one of my favorite rock drummers. Brian Downey from Thin Lizzy had the opportunity to manage Brian, obviously in the band and be with yeah. Brian. And, you know, and Brian's just a, you know, Mickey D. I mean, you know, unfortunately, Mickey's been in Motorhead and the, and the um, Scorpions, which none of them, highlight how good a player he is you know when he was in king diamond some of the stuff he did was phenomenal but you sit you sit down with mickey behind the kit and just watch him groove yeah he's so good you know you know you know and and that's you know but listen you know it's like you know what's what what's the uh what's that old joke you know what what's the million dollar beat boom da boom yeah boom you know beat it michael jackson Exactly. You know, and it's literally just, you know, it's just for the floor, you know, yeah. easy. You know? Well, I, I and, don't know. Oh, carry on. No, no, I'm just saying. Yeah. So, so, you know, that's why Mickey plays in the Scorpions and, you know, and I mean, listen, in Motorhead, he was phenomenal. You know, let's, yeah. let's face it, not, not everybody can play like Mickey D and he really brought that band up to a different level. You know, not there's anything, listen, not, not anything wrong with, with Phil um, Taylor or... <laughs> And obviously, Pete Pete Gill was a great drummer as well. Yeah, you know, he was. You know, yeah. you know and uh, but Mickey just really, I thought, you know, really raised that bar with that band. You know, totally. Yeah, and um, yeah. What, what I was going to say, I don't know if you can see the, the the drum skin in the corner there. Yeah, yeah. That's um, a friend of mine got it signed for me from Phil Rudd. So I always oh, think cool. I always think of him as like this. The, the whole concept of this podcast is called Drum for the Song. It's like when it comes down to it, he's he's the man in the rock world. He just keeps it real, and he's in the biggest rock band on the planet. Well, it's funny because I always play behind the beat. I've always have done. I think um, I do. And, 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 <laughs> and, you know, and I always use the joke that the reason Phil Rudd left ACDC in '83 and came back in '95 because he was still in the studio re- recording all those albums because he was so far behind the beat, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but he, no, he, you know, but obviously, you know, what, what made ACDC, you got the bass on the nail, you got, the, you got the, the snare drum just behind, and you got the guitar pushing it, 
Yes, that's true. You know, if you listen to Shoot to Thrill, which is one of my favorite ACDC songs off Back in Black, right? And just listen to that, listen to the way that guitar is pushing that, that, that song and listen to the basses on the nail and the drums are just bringing it, just making that, oh my God, I'm getting goosebumps to think yeah. about that song because <laughs> that, that to me, yeah, Phil, Phil's the, you know, Phil's like, you know, like going back to the Joe Morello Carmine clinic thing, you know, Phil's a guy that everybody can relate to. Yes. But, but not, but n nobody can really play like Phil. You know, there's a certain thing that, but like Lars Ulrich, bless yep. him. He, get, he gets a lot of bad press, but no. Lars, Lars was, Lars inspired a generation of drummers, you know, really did. And one of the inspiration with Lars is that you, I can, if I be hurt, I can practice a bit. I can play like, like Lars, you know, you know, because Lars doesn't do anything that's, that's that difficult, but, no. he, but, but he was a pioneer uh, of that, you know, and you can learn, I learn from everybody. I'm, I'm very open-minded now. I love watching other drummers. Cool. I don't, I, you know, I, I'm very hard on myself. That's why, you know, I, on the one-to-one -one lessons with Gary, you know, it's, it's very, um, you know, he, Adam, you can play the drum. What are you talking about? It sounds great. I go, you're just saying that. And he goes, no, honestly, let's, let's re re record it and let's see, you know, so, and I've just got to tidy things up when he teaches me stuff, but I'm, you know, I'm going to, I've got to get in the office today, do a day's work this evening. I'll sit in my drum room and I'll be going through the stuff that we went through yesterday, you know, oh, and, uh, you know, and I'll have two or two, two hours in there. And then, you know, it'll, that's my sort of, time you know of, and if i'm if i'm watching the tv if i'm watching a youtube thing or watching a podcast i will sit and play on my pad and Brilliant. that you know and that's what there's so many people say how do i get into the how do i become a mu mu musician well you don't become it you you kind of are it you know what i mean you you know you know you kind of but just like i just wish i'd had lessons i, I know a lot of people go well i was self-taught and uh you know, like Rob Brown, who's one of my favorite internet guys, you know. Yeah, I still um, need to check uh, him out. Know, yeah, you know, I mean, he's 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 self-taught, but he used videos. He used um, the, uh, you know, video cassettes from his favorite drummers. And he was really, you know, but I mean, what feel that that guy has. And I'm and I just I'm in awe of of his of his lessons. He's very good at communicating as well, because these guys that are great players that can't teach. Yeah, you know, they, they, they can't communicate. You know, but uh, so yeah. Anyway, great. it's been great, mate. No, Thank no, you yeah. So much. I think that's I really a good, this. good way to end. Um, keep practicing, everybody. When you've yeah. got time, when you've got little Absolutely. pockets of time where you could just sit at a pad for five minutes, use use that time. Um, I'm going to try and do it myself. We're realizing in the past I perhaps haven't taken full advantage of those moments. Um, time is precious. We're all getting older, and uh, yeah. And thank you, Adam, for taking the time. Um, just thank before, you, Dave. Really just, appreciate it. just before I click the finish button, you mentioned you might be starting something up yourself to show off your vintage drums. Have you got anything you can reveal about that? Or yeah, sure, different? sure. Yeah, no, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. Yeah, called Adam's Drum Room. And again, I'm just trying to get the time right now. One of the things that I've got, I want to photograph everything and do a website and kind of so that people can see what my collection is. Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of going to photograph it all when I'm, when I'm doing the sound samples. So when my friend Joey can come out, we can do that. Then it's kind of, this is what, but I'm just, to be honest, even though we're not live touring, I'm, I'm as busy as ever in the management office. So it's trying to find time, but it's going to be called Adam's Drum Room. And um, it is going to be um, basically just, I say weekly, well, whenever I have time, it'll be snippets of me going, the first one's gonna be me just showing you the drum room, going like 45 minutes of me going through the drum room, explaining what's in my collection, how it all works. Then I'm gonna take bits and pieces, like I'll do, not necessarily demonstrations, even though I will, do the odd sound bite of them and all that, but you know, um, and not reviews, just really talking drums. I'm going to have a few other collect uh, collectors on that I know. Yeah, um, it was actually my, this idea came from a couple of people on Facebook. So I'm in a bunch of Facebook, you know, drum nuts, you know, and uh, they said, you know, we should we should do something 
where you're showing off your, your gear, you know. This is not all vin vintage drums. It's a lot of newer stuff. You know, I've got stuff starting in the, I don't know, from the 60s, really. You know, I've not got anything earlier than that. But to me, it's just nice gear, you know, yeah. stuff that, um, like this British drum company stuff, you know, um, this Ludwig stuff, I've got a, I've got a maple, bird's eye maple um, Ludwig six and a half there from about 2008. Um, stuff that's not necessarily this Craviotto snare. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. There is only one of three of these in the world what? with this, with this salmon pink finish. Now, I got this drum. I won it in a raffle at the Hollywood Drum Show. What? It was the, it was the grand prize. Um, and I had my raffle ticket and I won it. And you know what? It's extreme. I would never sell it, not for any money in the world, even though I got it for free. Titanium, wow. concrete, aluminium, maple, the Neil Pert. You see this one here? The Neil oh, Pert yeah, Starman yeah. Snare. Yeah. Copper with gold hardware. This is a John um, Aldridge engraved DW. Uh, what have we got here? This is a Craviotto DW. Um, this is a 13 by 7 solid shell. There's a, 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 a newer Grex drum, but I just love, love that drum. It looks great. This is a carbon fiber. This is a stainless steel with gold hardware. So what I'll be doing is I'll be, I mean, if you're not a drum nerd, you're going to hate this. You're yeah, yeah. Get that your mind. So, you know, this is purely for the nerds out there like me. But I'm also not a big... I, I don't, I get bored when people go, well, I've got a 12 ply uh, rack tom and I've got a uh, 20 ply bass drum and I've got a, I've got a two ply snare and, you know, and the, the inner, you know, is it, is it wood? You know, okay. Is it maple? Is it birch? You know, that's really what I want to know. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, um, so it's not going to be too nerdy, but kind of just showing the collection and just having a few collectors on getting people to ask questions and, you know, because that's what I like. I mean, I go onto some of these drum channels, these collectors channels, and I can, it's, it's, it's mainstream TV viewing for me. Yeah. You know, right. I just love it, you know. So, yeah. so that's what it, yeah, Adam's drum room is going to be up. Um, and um, I'll get a Facebook page and Instagram and, um, and then the YouTube channel. So, yeah, I've kind of got, you know, I'm just getting it set up now to do that. And uh, so within a couple of months, it'll be there, you know, Brilliant. probably max, maximum. And when, whenever you're ready to launch, obviously I can share share your your links and Lovely. stuff on, on my Lovely. channels and stuff like that to help you out. But yeah, thanks again, Adam. I really enjoyed this. Thank you, Dave. Um, yeah, we'll keep in touch. And um, yeah, I'm glad to finally see your collection. It's amazing. So Lovely. Thank you, mate. And yeah. give my give my regards to your dad when you see him, and uh, and we will talk and we'll talk soon. I certainly will. Cool. Cheers, Lovely. Adam. Thanks, thanks for mate. listening, everyone. Cheers. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.